All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the second day of the Zooplankton Ecology Symposium. So this symposium is jointly organized by the Delta Science Program at the Delta Stewardship Council, along with our partners in the Interagency Ecological Program from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the California Department of Water Resources. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Um, looks like everyone's doing a great job, but we're just going to ask you to please uh, be sure to mute yourself and turn off your webcam upon entry. Um, if anyone is joining us via the phone, um, that's when it's most important to please mute your phone since it's um, a little bit more difficult for us to do that on our end. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat to type your questions into the chat. And um, yesterday, a lot of the speakers were happy to keep answering questions after their talks ended and keep the conversation flowing in the chat. Um, if you want to volunteer to speak, um, we ask you to type your name into the chat as well, or if you have the raise hand function, you could use that, um, but some people don't have that available. If you encounter any technical issues, um, please email the email address on the screen. It's engage at deltacouncil.ca.gov, or you can call or text um, the phone number 916-798. 9817. Uh, if you are a social media user, we have a hashtag, hashtag ZoopSimp2020, so feel free to use that on Twitter if you are engaging on that platform. Um, and we also have a Google group listserv that we've established for ongoing conversations after the symposium, um, and that link is in the top right of the screen. It's groups.google.com slash g slash zoop fest. So we'll get started in about three minutes um, with our first speaker. Sam, I can take down a slide too if you want um, Debbie to start setting up hers. Yeah. I I guess we might as well get that going, Debbie, if you don't mind. OK, will do. Yeah. Christine, are you on? I am. OK. I will then hand it off to you to get things started in about two minutes, I think. OK. Are you all seeing what you're supposed to be seeing? Yeah. Good. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sam, are we good to kick it off? Yeah, go for it. OK, great. OK, so good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Birdie. I am an environmental scientist with CDFW. And this morning, we're going to start it off with uh, Debbie Steinberg, who is a professor of marine science at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, William and Mary. And she's going to be talking to us today about zooplankton vertical, vertical migration. Take it away, Debbie. Great, thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation to come and talk with you all today. I've really, I've enjoyed the, the meeting so far. So um, I guess I'm, you know, speaking in the sort of behavior and ecology section of this meeting, and I was asked to talk about vertical migration, zooplankton vertical migration. And I'm going to discuss this very interesting zooplankton behavior and and do a little bit of ecosystem comparison, just give you some examples from different places. Um, I'm a biological oceanographer, I've worked in many different ecosystems. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit about what we found about zooplankton vertical migration and some of the studies in my laboratory. And I also want to acknowledge my co-authors uh, to my students, Kristen Sharp and Jack Conroy, and a postdoc in my lab, Karen Stamieshkin, who's going to be speaking to you shortly about an, another topic. So first, I'm going to just give a little bit of a primer on uh, zooplankton vertical migration for those of you who are not too familiar with the behavior, and a little bit about how we measure dial vertical migration. Um, and I'll give you some examples from different ecosystems, touch on environmental controls, and then I just have a few parting thoughts for you. So first of all, what is vertical migration? So I'm going to focus this talk on diel vertical migration. So I'm going to define that first. And diel vertical migration is the, the, the rise of many planktonic organisms to the surface at uh, dusk and, you know, and the descent away from it uh, just before dawn. So they're up in the surface waters at night and they're down in the deep waters during the day. And this behavior has evolved in every major group of animals in the plankton, many uh, mesopelagic fishes undergo diel vertical migration. And it's found in both marine and freshwater systems occurs all over the world. And many call it the largest animal migration on our planet. And, and it probably is in terms of the abundance of animals that are moving on a daily basis. So it's very widespread. Uh, it's very important um, in, in the ocean, in estuaries, in freshwater. And, and so, um, I, the first thing I want to do is just put this migration in perspective um, to, so you can get an um, appreciation for how astounding it really is. Uh, so let's say we have a couple centimeter krill here in, in the ocean and that's migrating as much as say 500 meters up into the surface waters at night to feed on phytoplankton. So that's about a third of a mile. And that's about uh, 25,000 body lengths, okay, that this, that this little animal is traveling. Now, if you scale that up to the size of a human, and this is one of my colleagues, uh, an oceanographer, who's about six feet tall, 1.8 meters. If we scale that up to body lengths to human size, that's like traveling um, 45,000 meters to get dinner. That's 28 miles to get dinner every night. And just to put it in context here, that would be like if we were to, um, everyone in this meeting were to uh, take a trip from north of Palo Alto uh, to San Francisco for dinner, walking every single night. So it's, it's a long way to go. Um, there's lots of animals doing it. So, um, so how do they do it? How do they know um, to undergo this, um, this behavior? And it's pretty well established that their, their light is, uh, well, it's, it's, we know light is the cue and the stimulation for migration and um, that the animals are following an isolum or a layer of same light level. 
And so the ideas that conditions at sundown are like those experienced deeper in the daytime. And there's lots of evidence for this. Zooplankton are found lower on bright sunny days than on overcast days. They don't come up as high in the water column at night during full moons. Um, but also there's a component of this that is uh, just an, an endogenous or circadian rhythm. So an internal physiological rhythmicity um, in these organisms, like, you know, much like um, humans have um, circadian rhythm as well. Now, you might also wonder why do they do it? Um, you know, what is the selective advantage of vertical migration that could compensate a grazer for loss of food intake uh, during the day by staying in the deep waters at night? And uh, the main reason why zooplankton migrate is um, to avoid so the idea is that the more abundant food at the surface is exploited at night while visually orienting predators can be avoided during the day by migrating to a depth that's too dark for predators to see. So they're feeding in the surface waters under the cover of darkness at night um, so they can feed in peace and their predators won't bug them. And they're hiding out in the deeper dark waters during the day. Now there are other reasons um, uh, that have been put forward as well. I'm not going to go into, but I'll just to suffice it to say that predator avoidance is the biggie. So there's other kinds of vertical migration. And um, even though in this talk, I'm concentrating on diel vertical migration, I just wanted to mention that there's also demersal vertical migration. So these are zooplankton that emerge from the sediments um, or say coral reefs or coral reef substrates like coral rubble into the water column. Um, and this can happen also on a diel basis um, and, and also on lunar cycles as well. There's tidal vertical migration. Uh, so this is vertical migration. Zooplankton occurs at, at tidal periods. And uh, this also allows zooplankton to regulate their horizontal position. And this is very important for larval transport. And uh, Wim Kimmer is going to discuss that in his talk, so I, I'm not going to go over that. Uh, there's also ontogenetic or seasonal vertical migration. And this can be particularly important at high latitudes. And this is an example here of a, a seasonal vertical migrator. These are large neocalinous copepods in the subarctic Pacific that undergo a seasonal or life cycle migration where they're, they're basically, they're in the deeper waters, 400 to 1,000 meters depth um, in, the, in the winter time where they reproduce the, the eggs hatch and the stages go through, um, they go through their different molting stages as they're rising to the surface and arrive at the surface in the springtime in time for the bloom. And and they go through their, um, their copepidite their, uh, uh, stages and then uh, head back down to depth out in the late summer where they go and, and over, over winter again. So this is a life cycle migration that uh, many zooplankton also go through. So we're going to visit uh, several different ecosystems in this talk, um, all places where, where I've done some work. We're going to uh, show you some examples from the ocean station Papa in the subarctic uh, Pacific, a high nutrient, low chlorophyll area, the open ocean. We'll also discuss uh, some data from Chesapeake Bay right outside my, my window here. Uh, the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series study in the North uh, Atlantic subtropical gyre. So a very low nutrient oligotrophic region of the ocean. And then we'll also, um, I'll show you some, uh, a little bit of data from the Palmer Antarctica Long-Term Ecological Research Program. And so these are all um, places I've studied. I'm, I'm um, so direct two different zooplankton time series, one uh, off Bermuda and one here in the Antarctic. So well, I'll show you a little bit of data from those. So first, um, one way that we can study diel vertical migration is uh, using acoustics. And this shows you zooplankton diel vertical migration measured by an acoustic Doppler current profiler off Bermuda, off the, um, uh, the BATS time series station. And this was um, a 
placed on a mooring. And so it was recording acoustics uh, uh, year round and on all day long. And this is just an example from that morning. So we have the hour of the day here. And then this is the uh, acoustic signal. And what you see here is at nighttime, you see high biomass in the red here of zooplankton and surface 100 meters at night. But then you can see that during the day, that biomass decreases. And there's always zooplankton in the surface at night. Uh, I'm sorry, during uh, the day, but not as many at night. And at nighttime, again, you see here around eight o'clock at night, you see high biomass again of zooplankton and surface waters. And so this is this very clear dial vertical migration pattern. And if you, another thing that the ADCP can tell us is the uh, velocity of the migrators. So you can look at the relative vertical velocity of these particles, which some of which are zooplankton migrating. And, and we can see very clearly there's this little window where they're all going down. And that's at about oh, 4.30, um, 5 in the morning before just before the sun comes up. And right here is when they're all going up um, around just before 8 o'clock at night um, at dusk. And um, these velocities, this is in centimeters per second, but these velocities translate to you know, a couple hundred meters that these migrators are traveling per hour. Another way uh, that we often study dial vertical migration is using depth discrete net sampling. And this is the MOCNES, the Multiple Opening Closing Net, an environmental sensing system. And this is a net that's got, it's got 10, a frame that has 10 different nets on it. And in this instance, we're in, this, we're in the uh, North Pacific here, and um, we're putting this net down to 1,000 meters. And you send the net down to the bottom, and um, and then we, as we're pulling the net up, we're opening and closing the nets uh, and sampling at discrete depth intervals. And the, the net also has all sorts of sensors on it. So we're also getting temperature um, and salinity data, chlorophyll, oxygen at the same time. And you can see here it is going into the water. There's the 10 different nets. Essentially, as you, as you close one net, it opens the next one and we just keep pulling it up. In shallower water, like in estuaries, there's multi nets and smaller versions of this that people need to look at dis discrete depth um, profiles of zooplankton. So the um, change the slide. So just to show you some data from whoops, uh, let me go back here for a moment from one of these these nets. This is in the, the that station, Ocean Station Papa in the subarctic North Pacific. And these are what the data look like. So this is a couple different depth profiles. We've got the day on the left here and the night on the right. And you're looking from zero to a thousand meters. So we're talking deep open ocean here. And these are different size classes of biomass of, of, of zooplankton caught in the net. So the darker blue are larger size classes, and then the redder colors are smaller size classes. And the first thing, and then the yellow here is a certain kind of uh, zooplankton, a south um, zooplankton. And I'll mention, talk more about that in a moment. But the first thing to notice is that there's this they're hanging out here in the higher biomass in the mesopelagic uh, during the day. And then a lot of these organisms are moving up into the surface waters at night. And just if you focus in, say I um, highlighted the salps here, you can see them down here between 400 and 500 meters during the day, and then up into the surface 50 meters at night. Down here is another example from a, a different um, sampling pair where we have, um, Again, the animals are moving from down here in the mesopelagic zone into the surface waters, but we also have a shorter distance migration here. You can look at this blue bar during the day um, at 50 to 100 meters, there's high biomass. And then they're moving up into the surface 50 meters at night. And these are primarily, these are these neocalanus copepods doing a short distance migration on a diel basis. And so one thing we can look at is what is the sort of the strength of the migration at different places. And, um, and at this site, we, so we can compare the night, look at the night to day biomass ratios in the surface waters. 
And I've got it here by um, the top 50 meters and also the top 100 meters. And if you look at these, just, you know, just the different size classes, you can see that um, depending on the organisms and what size class we, you know, we have anywhere from a doubling of the biomass in the surface waters at night to, you know, over 30 times for, um, for some of the larger organisms. So there is a very large change in the surface community at night compared to the daytime. This is just to show you what some of the anim migrating animals look like. These are uh, the salps that I was just showing you in that graph. Uh, this is salpa aspera, a very large gelatinous zooplankton that is an internal mucus feeding web. And there are, I think of them as like little vacuum cleaners. They are filtering large, the large amounts of phytoplankton through their internal mucus feeding webs. And um, this is this is me holding just a whole big graduated cylinder full of these things um, that we collected in the surface waters at night. You can see they are compared to my hand there. So traveling now to a different ocean um, over to the Atlantic uh, subtropical gyre. These are long term time series data from the Bermuda Atlantic time series study off Bermuda. This is a deep ocean site. Um, it's a biogeochemical time series that's um, been going on since 1988, and we've been doing zooplankton sampling there since 1994. And on the left here shows you the uh, annual biomass anomaly of zooplankton at the site. And so this is the below the bar here. These are lower than average um, zooplankton biomass, and then uh, and the red is is higher than the long term average. And the first thing to notice is that there is a long term increase um, with with some ups and downs um, through the years. But um, we do have a long term increase in the, the epipelagic zero to 150 meter zooplankton biomass at the site. And we think it's due to uh, increases in primary production in some smaller phytoplankton uh, in in the in the Sargasso Sea at bats. And we can split the data up lots of different ways. I'm just showing you here, since we're talking about dial vertical migration, this is the uh, daytime um, data here for the time series. And then we have the nighttime data. Those points are averages of uh, pair day and night toes that are taken on monthly cruises. And then the blue line is a three point moving average. And if you just look at just over time, you can see this this um, increase. There's about a 50 percent increase uh, over time in the in the biomass uh, that's integrated through the water column. And you might also notice that the nighttime increase is slightly higher than the daytime increase. And so if we subtract the daytime from the night, we can get a sense of what like the migrators are doing. And there's actually a slight increase in the migrator biomass over time. And this has all sorts of implications for um, all sorts of things like um, grazing and um, things like fecal pellet production. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. These are just to zero, go look at some of the, um, the taxa that are migrating at bats. And so this is the mean uh, day and night density over monthly data for 11 years of the time series. Um, and these are, we see here, the, the dark bars here are the nighttime biomass and the gray is the daytime. And asterisk is where there's significantly higher uh, biomass in, at, of these migrators in the surface waters at night versus during the day. And for most of these groups, uh, there is higher biomass at night than during the day. Some of them are very strong migrators like euphausids or krill, and that's an example of one. We've also got uh, calanoid copepods like this one, Pleuromama, that is a strong migrator. So the point here being that most of the different taxa are significantly higher in the surface waters at night. So now we're going to travel to the Southern Ocean and um, the, the uh, Palmer Antarctica uh, zooplankton time series. And plankton dial vertical migration during summer in the polar oceans um, was presumed to be dampened um, due to near continuous 
daylight in the summertime. And the same is true in the polar oceans uh, in wintertime when there's no light. Um, that since light is a cue for migration, it was just assumed that it didn't happen. Well, we find that it actually does happen. So this is summertime, um, whoops, sorry, uh, day of vertical migration of, of zooplankton in the summertime at, at um, this site. And which see here, these are salps. This is again, daytime versus nighttime. So we've got daytime. Um, they're down here in the deeper waters coming up into the surface waters at night. This is a strong migrating copepod metridia, again, hanging out in deep waters, going into the surface at night. Another really strong migrator are these ostracods. And again, here they are down at depth during the day and into the surface waters at night. So even in polar summer, we see plankton dial vertical migration. Uh, taking you to the estuary now, this is out my backyard in Chesapeake Bay. And again, this, this is um, some work from my uh, one of my graduate students, Kristen Sharp, showing daytime sur uh, surface biomass of zooplankton uh, just in the top surface um, couple, couple meters in Chesapeake Bay in the York River. So this is daytime versus night. And these are, she's doing sampling during different uh, over the seasons. And for usually there's, you know, again, there's higher biomass of zooplankton at night, sometimes as much as 10 times higher in the surface waters. And what's interesting is, um, is this can affect both grazing and, and carbon and nutrient cycling. So what she did here is uh, some experiments looking at fecal pellet production by the zooplankton for, in different size classes. Um, and during the day versus the night. And which and this is the control with no, so this is fecal pellets and we're measuring just bio volume, which is just a, a measure of the total amount of fecal pellets here. And what she found is that, um, you know, during the day there's a little bit of fecal pellet production um, over the controls, but at night you can see there's a lot more fecal pellet production from zooplankton in all these different size classes. And these are some of the fecal pellets here. There's a, a little, there's an Acarcia species copepod, there's its fecal pellet. Here's another fecal pellet here, probably from a mycid or a small decapod. So I think um, I'll just, I just want to have, leave some time for questions here, but just suffice it to say that there's lots of things that control the migration, the optical environment, how clear the water is, and this is just showing how the amplitude or the, the distance that zooplankton are traveling is higher um, when wa the water is clear. It's also um, the biomass of migrators is higher, um, the more primary reduction in surface waters. So there's a lot of different controls on migration. So just to, uh, some parting thoughts, dial vertical migration is widespread and varied. It's a totally different community at night. And you can think of this like when you, you know, humans, you know, we go to, have you ever been grocery shopping, you know, at two in the morning, totally people in the grocery store, right? So, um, so think it, we should think about that with our sampling. Um, and migration exerts control on pelagic food web structure and on biogeochemical cycles. And we can use environmental controls to predict and model vertical migration, but it's very complicated. Um, so I'll thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. And uh, thanks for the meeting. Thanks, Debbie. That was that was really great. I know I never want to walk 30 miles to get my food. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a couple questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we may have one minute to get to that. Actually, let's maybe you can answer the ones in the chat later and we can get to um, the people raising their hands. So you okay. go to you and see you have your hand raised. Yeah, go ahead, and I can't see you as your hand raised, so just go ahead and speak up. You go, Terry, oh. are you there? Oh. It looks like we have Mark. Okay. Okay, well, um, hi, Debbie Mark Oman here. Thanks for the hi, overview. Mark. 
Um, in defining DVM, uh, let's be sure not to exclude reverse DVM. Yeah. Because there are some um, uh, really important examples in both the ocean and, and in lakes in particular um, of animals that are elevated at the surface by day and descend by night, um, subject to a very different guild of predators. Yes, thanks for bringing that up, Mark. And I actually um, meant to mention that, and it totally slipped my mind. And he's absolutely right. There, there is the opposite, um, and you know, there's there's organisms that are escaping. There are predators that are diavertically migrating, and Mark has a really classic paper on that. So uh, we, it, it is complicated. So we have to, um, and it's you know, it's all about um, you know, avoiding predators. So. So some of these patterns are, are pretty tricky to tease out. Thanks. Okay, I think with that we have to move on, but Debbie, there's quite a few questions in the chat for you if you wanna okay. um, get to those if you can. We'll do. Um, <laughs> so next up we have Michelle Youngbluth, who is an adjunct prof assistant professor of biology at the Estuary and Ocean Science Center at San Francisco State University. And she's going to be talking to us today about feeding and predation in the plankton. Take it away, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today about grazing and predation in the plankton. Um, this is admittedly a huge topic to present on, so I hope to do justice to all of the work that's been done um, and give a good overview of the topic. I will be focusing on feeding primarily by the zooplankton. Um, I will be ignoring heterotrophic and mixotrophic microzooplankton and benthic or nectonic feeding on zooplankton. And I will plan, I'm going to be talking about how they find food, what's their feeding style, how we study feeding, methods and their applications and their limitations. And then a little bit about my experience, which is primarily with molecular methods for food web studies. As we all uh, are fairly aware of at this point, zooplankton play a critical role in aquatic food webs as intermediaries between the primary producers and higher pelagic predators like fish and fish larvae. Um, and that's sort of the, the focus is feeding by zooplankton on sort of the lower groups here of this talk. Um, but why do we care? Usually it's from the fish perspective because we, we like fish, of course, um, but some important questions that um, usually sort of drive our research, not that I'm going, and I'm not going to be addressing these today, but, um, but these are things that we usually have in mind when we're trying to figure out what's going on with zooplankton and their feeding, it include are some conditions or habitats providing better quality food than others? Are food resources limiting zooplankton growth or egg production rates? Who are important prey and are, these, are there conditions where these are enhanced? And what happens when food web composition changes, such as with things like introduced species? Some things to be aware of that I'm not going to be able to talk about much, but they're important concepts. Um, Microzooplankton grazing can be an important source of removing primary production. We know that heterotrophic and mixotrophic dinoflagellates can be important grazers in productive systems like the San Francisco estuary, or just estuaries in general, I should say, um, and upwelling systems. Um, I shouldn't, I, I'm not sure if we've actually directly studied dinoflagellate graz, grazing in the estuary, but we know from sort of reviews that up to 60% of primary production may be consumed daily by mixotrophic um, microzooplankton. But they're still a bit of a black box. They're hard to study, and that's why I, I can't talk much about them today. Um, I'm focusing on the sort of broader groups of zooplankton. Um, we also know that zooplankton exhibit selective feeding. Um, not all of them, but many of them, uh, we assume they select larger prey or higher quality prey, and they're able to sense that. And I'll talk a little bit about that. 
And uh, zooplankton feeding is important from a nutrient and resource budget perspective. Um, and just some keywords that I assume will be covered in Dr. St Stemieshkin, hopefully I did that right, um, in her talk next uh, will be the biological carbon pump. Um, maybe she'll mention sloppy feeding and nutrient ratios, um, but that's about as far as I can go with that um, in my talk today. Okay, so how do zooplankton find food? We know that in general, there are four major feeding styles that includes passive ambush feeding, active ambush feeding, cruise feeding, and feeding current feeding. And I'll talk briefly about each of those here. So first, passive ambush feeding, or also known as it's a trap. <laughs> um, these use a trap sort of system, things like mucus nets, tentacles, spines to intercept prey. So I like this picture of the tinafore with its long tentacles and um, that's similar to Mark Oman's picture that he showed yesterday, um, where they sit in the water column, they deploy these intricate systems of tentacles and wait for prey to collide with those tentacles. So that's sort of the passive ambush style. This also occurs in foraminiferans, uh, pteropods, some pteropods, and uh, helioflagellate as shown here. Then we have the active ambush predators. Um, these include a variety of zooplankton, um, some predatory copepods, ketognaths are a classic example, crabzoea, some protozoans, and others. This is where a non-motile, quote unquote, they sit and wait, so that the predator sits and waits um, for their prey to come within some sensory range, and then when it detects it, they attack it. Um, so they can detect that we, with either mechanosensory CTA, where they have these hairs on their bodies that can feel for movement around them, them in the water, or chemosensory CTA. They essentially taste the water. They taste the sort of uh, leaky stuff coming from prey organisms, and then they're able to sort of follow the direction of that and attack. <coughs> Then we have the cruise feeders, which I like deep space Homer. Not perfect example, but you know. Um, and this is active and intentional swimming to encounter your prey. Um, good examples are larval fishes uh, because they are visual feeders. They require a lot of food um, to grow and survive. And so they have to actively cruise around looking for prey and then consume it. Um, the example given in the Kiribo review also talks about copepods that are detrital feeders. And I like this figure here because it shows a copepod cruising along. Um, yeah, cruising along. And then it comes across the sort of chemical trail from a sinking detrital aggregate. When it detects that trail, it can then follow it to the food source. So that's sort of a, a good example of a copepod detrital cruise feeder. And then we have feeding current feeding, which is common in diverse groups of zooplankton, maybe the most common across uh, the zooplankton. And there are three subcategories within the feeding current feeders, filter feeders, scanning current feeders, and direct interception feeders. Within the filter feeders, this is this includes most holo and mirroplanktonic zooplankton. And by holo and miro, I mean <clears throat> they're in the water column their whole life, or miroplankton is like larval stages of benthic organisms and things like that. So most of those fall in the filter feeding, feeding current category. This is where they pass water through filtering structure to capture prey indiscriminately. So I like the example of a larvation because they build these mucus houses that are their filtering structure. And they use their body or tail structure to sort of pump water through their mucus house and any particles that go in there get filtered. <clears throat> Once their house clogs up with particles, they ditch their house and then they go build another one. Um, so that's sort of a unique but good example of filter feeding. This also occurs in some copepods, um, 
Dolly OLEDs, I believe SELPs, as Debbie mentioned, and uh, some Hydromedusa and all sorts of other things. Then we also have the feeding current, scanning current feeders. Um, and this is sort of a, um, a selective version of feeding current feeders described, I believe, initially by Cole and Strickler in 1981, where they did these unique experiments, literally gluing a dog hair to the back of a copepod and then filming it feeding with high speed videography. Um, and they found that um, this copepod would generate their feeding current. And when it uh, sensed, I believe chemo sensed, a larger, tastier prey item entering its sort of aura, it didn't come into contact, so it was definitely sensing the chemicals in the water. It would reach up and grab that prey item. So it was selectively um, scanning and grabbing uh, tastier particles. Um, and I'll just show a quick video. It doesn't show the, the exact sort of uh, selection, but you can clearly see the feeding current that copepods generate. And that sort of vortex that they create. <clears throat> and then we have direct interceptors. Um, this is where the swimming activities bring them into random contact with the prey without filtering. Um, I think a good way to visualize this is a Medusa pumping water with their umbrella structure. And that pumping passes fluid past their filtering tentacles. And any prey in that fluid um, will, much of the prey in that fluid will come into contact with the tentacles and be captured and consumed. Um, this also, I guess, happens in some flagellates. They generate <coughs> a uh, current with their flagellum. Okay, so how do we study zooplankton feeding? Um, there are a range of methods that are both direct and indirect. And whether you want one or the other depends on the question of interest. So if you're interested in a single or dominant species in a well-defined environment, you probably want to do direct experiments. And most of the time, this is a bottle experiment. Um, if you're interested in multi-species assemblage or a whole trophic level, you probably want to use indirect methods, um, things that usually involve bulk community measurements, or you could do many single experiments directly with different species. A couple of examples of indirect methods include uh, doing things like a production to biomass ratio. Um, these can be sort of indicators of the stability or instability of a system, whether or not it's at equilibrium or if there's net growth or death. Um, and these can be combined with other calculations to get annual rates of feeding. Um, I think the IC zooplankton methodology manual is a pretty good one for all sorts of methods if you're interested in more information. Um, you could also do stable isotope analysis, and this can be useful for indicating primary trophic interactions for groups of interest. So um, you can look at enrichment in carbon and nitrogen isotopes um, that happens with sort of different trophic levels. and um, that can be useful to figure out if your predator is primarily a grazer, a primary grazer, a secondary predator, that sort of thing. <coughs> For direct methods, there are a few different techniques. Bottle incubations, as I've mentioned, are one of the primary ways to look at feeding in the zooplankton. These can be done in the lab or the field. Usually it involves incubating a predator with their prey. The prey can be a single cultured prey item or a mixed assemblage. Doing mixed assemblages in bottles is really tricky um, for reasons I'll mention later, but mostly you have a risk for trophic cascades and it's really hard to characterize different components of the, the sort of phytoplankton and zooplankton community with, um, with single methods. There's not really one good method to do that. But in these bottle incubations, you uh, essentially compare the initial prey abundances to the abundance of them after an incubation period to figure out what was removed by the predator. 
Um, you can also use bottle incubations for growth or egg production rates to look at how the food stimulates growth and how well it stimulates growth. Um, there's also videography. Um, this works better for larger predators or, yeah, and looking at sort of behavioral predator-prey interactions. And I think Rudy Strickler and associates have done a lot of really uh, cool work looking at both copepods and some fish. Um, and then there are direct methods looking at field collected animals. Again, you can do growth in egg production rates here um, on field collected animals. You can do gut dissection. That doesn't work very well with most of our zooplankters, but for things like larval fishes um, and the larger zooplankton, um, it's possible, but there are challenges with identifying the prey. You can also do gut fluorescence, but that only tells you whether they're eating phytoplankton or photosynthetic uh, organisms. Um, and then you have dietary DNA. Some important concepts with uh, feeding experiments and what we're looking at is usually rates, um, ingestion rates, the food ingested per predator per day, um, or the clearance rate, or um, the volume of water cleared of food per predator per day, um, or the daily ration, which is pretty much the ingestion rate divided or uh, expressed as a percentage of the predator mass, which is useful for comparing across species. And uh, from doing single predator, single prey experiments, we've learned a lot about how ingestion rate changes with prey abundance. Um, so this figure on the right is showing sort of the classic frost um, functional response curves, where at uh, this was Calanus, a copepod feeding on different diatom species. And at low prey concentration, ingestion rates are low because it's spending a lot of time, uh, most of its time sort of filtering and searching for the food um, and a little bit of time handling. And as you increase that prey concentration, the searching time goes down, but the handling time goes up and it re reaches a, a point, the maximum ingestion rate, where it's not going to increase its ingestion rate more because the handling time is, it's spending all of its time handling the prey, um, or it's also satiated likely at that point. Um, and we found that larger cells have lower maximum ingestion rate, and you can picture either a large cheeseburger or a tiny slider, you're gonna get, um, you're gonna get full from a large cheese cheeseburger a lot faster than, you know, a tiny slider. You have to eat more of those tiny sliders to satiate yourself. So with bottle incubations, um, there are a lot of different measurements that you might want to make uh, to characterize the prey community. And this is an overwhelming table for a reason to sort of show that there are a lot of different methods to look at different components of the prey community. And they all have their good things and their challenges. Um, some characterize pigments effectively, some of them characterize the diversity but aren't yet quantitative. Um, some of them only give you size ranges, et cetera. So no single measurement that we have yet can characterize and quantify all potential prey of interest, unless you have a very simple predator, which I don't think exists. So um, you have to be sure to design your experiments to adjust your questions of interest and do your best to kind of know what kind of prey you're dealing with. Okay. Um, now I'm gonna get into some of the studies in the Kimmer lab and my own work primarily using genetic techniques to look at uh, sort of zooplankton feeding and zooplankton um, food web studies. So this first one here was a study done by Ann Holmes, who may be online. Um, she was a master's student in Wimslam, now a UC Davis PhD student. And she did some great work um, doing high throughput sequencing to look at the diet of Pseudodioptimus forbizae um, and um, essentially sequenced, uh, sequenced the prey in the copepod guts, compared that to what was in the water, and found an unexpectedly high amount of cyanobacterial DNA and low cryptophytes in the diets, um, sort of relative abundances. Um, that's one of the challenges with sequencing, is you can't get absolute abundance, abundances yet. Um, so 
wonderful Cheryl, Cheryl Patel, who I know is online, um, her master's project is aimed at designing qPCR assays to quantify ingestion on cryptophytes and cyanobacteria. So stay tuned. Now that we can get back in the lab, she'll be wrapping that work up soon. So much of my experience is with qPCR assays, and one of the studies that we published recently was designing an assay to quantify ingestion of a big diatom bloom that occurred in 2016 of Alacosyra granulata. It was sort of a rapid response study. They saw this bloom happening and um, were able to go out and sample it kind of on the tail end of the bloom, but the um, the diatom was super abundant still, and we found relatively low abundance of the uh, diatom in the guts of this copepod and sort of concluded that they're not directly supported by the diatom. We observed occasionally high egg production rates in response to the bloom, but they weren't feeding on the diatom itself. So, um, so we, yeah, so that was a sort of interesting result. And I had to do a plug for this because of our discussion of um, getting biomass from more zooplankton in the San Francisco estuary. Um, I have done some work using uh, qPCR assays to estimate nuclear abundance. Um, and uh, there is some evidence that it works for biomass. So if you're interested in specific groups, this might be one way to uh, look at the biomass of organisms in the San Francisco estuary. So let me know. Okay, and finally, one of the cool projects that um, I got a preprint out recently and submitted to eDNA for review was looking at feeding habits and the prey of larval fishes in the estuary, primarily long fin smelts and herring larvae, using DNA metabarcoding of the guts of the species and then comparing that to the zooplankton assemblages. And some of the results that we found were, of course, we got species level ID of uh, a range of organisms, primarily different arthropod um, copepods and cladocerans, um, a couple mycid sequences, and then some interesting soft bodied things like um, nigerians and um, some other weird things like the Echinoderm and Lepisterius. Um, overall, we found similar uh, prey between the two species, higher abundance and uh, frequency of occurrence. So this is the, out of all the fishes analyzed, um, was there a presence or absence in, uh, yeah, uh, in more species, or more individuals of each of the species. And so, higher frequency of occurrence of limnoithona in the herring guts, um, and that's an introduced species, tiny cyclopoid copepod. Um, so I thought that that was interesting. It was also higher in relative abundance in the herring. So it seemed like the smell just weren't eating it despite its abundance in the zooplankton as well. There were also more fish found in the smelt, which I think hints at life history and ecology. Um, one of the things I thought about was, well, are these larval fish schooling with each other? And is that how the DNA is ending up in the gut is just proximity. Um, but it could also be that they're consuming eggs. We know from morphological analysis that they do consume other fish eggs. And of course, there's lots of unknown DNA, um, which is because of database limitations. So the more we do individual barcoding local species, the more gaps will be filled there. Okay, so in summary, there are diverse feeding styles in the zooplankton. Um, lots and lots of filter feeders. They can be selective, but there are other, other types of predation and setting up traps. Um, there are also many methods to study feeding, but bottle incubations are the most common and controlled experiments you could do. Um, each measurement you make has limitations, so be careful to be specific to your question of interest. And I am a proponent of molecular methods as powerful tools for zooplankton food web ecology and diversity. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if I have any time for questions, happy to answer it. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, we have about one minute for questions. If anybody has any questions, um, I'm not sure I see any in the chat. Oh, there are a couple in the chat. Uh, 
sorry, it's kind of hard to go back through all this. <clears throat> um, anybody that uh, asked a question in the chat, do you just want to raise your hand and speak up? Ask it now. All right, Sam, go on. All right. Um, I had a bit of a specific question. I was just wondering how are they possibly eating leptosterius since, you know, they don't have any larvae and are they picking them off the shore? Um, there were some weird things like that, that, um, that I think the DNA is real. It could be like, it could be dead bits from them. Like maybe they had, um, I don't know, a recent spawning event or something where there were just a lot of dead things or, or a dying event. It's hard. To, you can't really tell between feces, detritus, um, live life stage. That's the challenge with the DNA. So, yeah, that was one of the one of the like. Hmm? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny because mm -hmm. I think there's also last I heard there's still a major gap in their distribution from like Humboldt to Santa Cruz, maybe. Mm. They because they all died out from a harmful algal bloom a while ago, and mm. since they don't have larvae, they haven't really been able to come back. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really interesting. Interesting. That they show up. Yeah, I mean, it could be a tracer for some small population in the estuary too that we aren't seeing. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that's cool. that's one of those weird stories that that needs <laughs> sort of digging into. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, Michelle. We are out of time, so we are going to move on to our next speaker, and that is Karen Stamieskin. Hope I got that right. Um, postdoctoral associate, also at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and she's going to talk to us about the role of mesozooplankton in the ocean's biological carbon pump. Take it away, Karen. Thank you. I'm just making sure I share the correct screen here. Let's see if this works. Uh, not yet. Oh, I think we're there. All right, so um, thanks for that introduction. Yes, I'm Karen Stamieshkin. Um, I give all of you online here permission to just call me Karen. <laughs> so if you ever have to introduce me again, you can just call me Karen. Um, I also just want to mention quickly, my network connection is not amazing. So um, please interrupt me if I've cut off and, I, and I've you know frozen and stopped talking for a second so I can repeat myself. I apologize for that. Um, but yes, yeah, so I am a postdoc at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science with um, Debbie Steinberg. Um, I'm working with the NASA Exports Project um, which is a large interdisciplinary project to study the ocean's biological carbon pump. Um, and I just want to quickly acknowledge um, people who have contributed to this work. So definitely Deb Steinberg um, and Amy Moss, who are both PIs on this exports project. And then also I'll be presenting some work from um, a modeling study that I worked with folks over in Denmark on. Um, Philip Brun was the head uh, or lead author of that paper that I'll be presenting about. So um, I'm going to start with an overview of the biological carbon pump. And I will say this is a woefully biased talk towards, of course, zooplankton. Um, and then also the topics that I've been focusing um, mostly in, in my uh, both doctoral work and this postdoc so far. Um, so the biological carbon pump is a very complex set of processes that um, essentially entrain carbon dioxide, if you can see in this diagram, from the atmosphere into the surface ocean where it's then used by phytoplankton. Um, and then as Michelle just beautifully described to us, those phytoplankton are grazed on by a plethora of different organisms, including microzooplankton, which are smaller than mesozooplankton. Um, in this talk, I will focus on mesozooplankton. Um, but I just want to point out that you know, this, this complex suite of processes, it actually is estimated that it exports about 11 gigatons of carbon every year into the deep ocean um, from the surface ocean. And so without the functioning of the biological carbon pump, which is based on essentially um, planktonic activities, among other things, 
uh, we would have 50% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So if nothing else today, you can say you understand that plankton, including zooplankton, actually play a role in regulating Earth's climate. Um, so like I said, I'll be focusing on mesozooplankton, and this is kind of a, you know, it's almost like number semantics, but um, they're generally defined as being 0 0.2 to 2 millimeters in length. They include things, mesozooplankton includes things like euphosids here. We've got some copepods, a gelatinous zooplankton, or a, this is a salp in particular. We include some pelagic snails like pteropods um, and also uh, we have a little amphipod here. So these are just some examples of things that are considered mesozooplankton. Um, so this is a size-based definition, but it's also sort of a, a food web functionality-based definition as well. Um, I'm not including uh, these microzooplankton, which tend to be smaller, but they can also be mixotrophic. So um, that means that they can both photosynthesize and consume prey. So generally, when we talk about mesozooplankton, we're not talking about mixotrophic organisms. And we're not talking about organisms that, um, actually, I'm not going to say that. Never mind. So yeah, this is what we're talking about, <laughs> mesozooplankton. Um, so focusing in on this portion of the biological carbon pump diagram, um, we have our mesozooplankton that are in the surface waters feeding, presumably at night because, um, as Debbie explained, they migrate up and down in the water column and feed mainly at night in surface waters. Um, and as they feed, they produce fecal pellets, so they poop. Um, I've been yelled at for calling it poop in a talk, so they ingest, they don't poop. Um, they ingest these fecal pellets, which sink into uh, the deeper waters uh, where it can essentially uh, become part of the mesopelagic food web. So that carbon that's transferred from the atmosphere to phytoplankton that's then eaten by zooplankton is sequestered, we could say, um, into the deep ocean via these sinking pellets. So that's the egestion portion of what we call passive carbon flux. We call it passive because these particles are passively sinking. Um, another way that, or another mode of passive carbon flux is, is, is uh, organisms dying and sinking. And so this may seem like an unlikely way for carbon to reach the seafloor, but there have actually been accounts of gelatinous plankton carcasses thousands of meters deep on the seafloor of the Pacific. So this is a significant source of carbon to the deep ocean. Um, I wanted to include this visual of the, of the process of feeding, um, turning smaller particles into larger fecal pellets that then sink faster because of their density and size. Um, so these were a set of experiments that I did to try to quantify that shift in particle size spectrum due to feeding. And so in these black bars, these are the numbers of particles in these different size bins that you see on the x-axis in experimental containers that did not have grazing by mesozooplankton. And then the white bars are the containers that did have grazing. And so you can see by the difference of black to white bars, zooplankton were grazing down, oops, sorry. Uh, zooplankton were grazing down this part of the particle size spectrum, and then they were producing fecal pellets, which clearly are larger. And this seems intuitive, but being able to quantify that is an important part of quantifying um, the biological carbon pump. All right. So then we also um, have what we call active carbon transport. Um, and Debbie did a great job setting me up for this. Um, so active carbon transport means that zooplankton that have been feeding in the surface waters at night actively migrate to the deeper waters during the day where they then breathe out carbon dioxide, they excrete, um, so that's usually associated with dissolved organic carbon, they ingest, producing fecal pellets, and they can also be eaten or die at depth. So that's another mode of, um, of carbon export. So we think of these two contrasting modes of active versus passive carbon export. Um, and actually, this is a nicer diagram or a more detailed diagram of that process of uh, active transport, which I just explained. Um, but again, you see 
the phytoplankton in the surface waters. Um, and as we move from left to right, we're moving from nighttime to daytime to nighttime. And you can see uh, the little copepod producing its fecal pellets and its carbon dioxide in the surface at night and then migrating to depth and doing, um, you know, producing less fecal pellets because it's presumably feeding less at depth, but still breathing out CO2 um, at depth and then migrating back to the surface. And here's our big fish predator. So a major question that we have um, is how do changes in the mesozooplankton community or the composition of that community impact the biological carbon pump? And this is a great visual from uh, Steinberg and Landry 2017 to show um, fecal pellets. So these particles that have been ejected by zooplankton in sediment traps um, in all different parts of the world that have different zooplankton communities. Um, and so you can see sometimes the fecal pellets are numerous and medium sized or numerous and large or almost non-existent and very, very tiny. And so all of this has to do with obviously the community that's producing them. And how do we measure these impacts of zooplankton composition on, um, on carbon export? So one of the ways we do this is through field experiments and observations. So Debbie mentioned the exports program and I've mentioned it several times, but um, here's a nice picture of what went on. Um, so we took two ships, um, the Ravel, the Roger Ravel and the Sally Ride out to Ocean Station Papa. Um, this was our zooplankton team uh, that did a lot of work. Um, Ocean Station Papa is here out in the high nutrient, uh, sorry, yeah, high nutrient low chlorophyll North Pacific. Um, and we went out and we studied, um, well, actually the larger program studied almost every aspect of the biological carbon pump for about a month. Um, so what we did specifically was fecal pellet production experiments as one aspect of trying to quantify how zooplankton were affecting uh, carbon export. And so this um, is very clear, but this is a, or crystal clear, <laughs> a, um, an experimental chamber that we used for fecal pellet production. So you can see um, inside there's, there's an outer container that contains seawater, and then inside there's actually a mesh bottomed insert which contains the zooplankton. Um, and so for the duration of the experiment, I'll play this video, the zooplankton are happily swimming around inside their little insert in the container, feeding on whatever prey are available, producing fecal pellets. And then those fecal pellets are falling through the bottom of that insert so that, um, so that they can't interfere. So, so some zooplankton actually feed on fecal pellets or when they interact with them, they break them into tiny pieces. So to make sure we were getting an accurate fecal pellet production measurement, you have to um, separate the zooplankton from their feces basically. Um, so we did this for individual species. So these tiny little um, clausocalanus are bright blue and really cool. Um, but we did this for several species. And then we also did whole community fecal pellet production experiments. And we had this elaborate, <laughs> you can see um, tons of buckets of seawater and lots of different containers and sieves. So we could elaborately um, size fractionate the zooplankton community into five size fractions um, and run these whole community fecal pellet production experiments. And I just wanna emphasize how challenging it was to size fractionate the zooplankton community while keeping them in seawater so that they stayed really happy. Um, people who do field work will understand how difficult this is. So we, we perfected our methods here. And so you can see it's kind of like a cooking show on deck. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I mentioned um, part of active transport is respiration at depth. And so one of our colleagues, Amy Moss, who's a PI on this project, she um, and her group measured zooplankton respiration rates. And so they collected zooplankton um, that were migrating. So they collected them at night in the surface waters and then incubated them in con under conditions that you would find in the mesopelagic. So those would, that would be like their daytime migration depth conditions. And so we did these experiments to find out how much carbon dioxide 
um, and dissolved organic carbon, these zooplankton were actively transporting to depth. Um, those were those bottle experiments. And then on the right here is a picture of Amy and her technician, Andrea, doing um, bulk measurements of ETS or electron transport system measurements. Nice. So it's another, someone not muted. It's another way um, <laughs> to, um, to get at respiration rates. Um, so Dev had some great videos of the mock nest. So the final thing we had to do in order to estimate whole plankton or zooplankton community um, carbon production and um, in the system was to get a picture of actual biomass of these different size fractions of the community. So we did these mock nest toasts to get biomass um, of different organisms. So here are some cool results. Um, this is a picture of the um, what came out of our mock nest nets. So to orient you, on the left column here is is daytime and on the right is nighttime. And then each bucket pair is a different depth stratum. So this top um, day-night pair is a picture of what we saw in the nets from zero to 50 meters. Then we go to 50 to 100 meters, et cetera, all the way down to 750 to 1,000 meters um, in these bottom buckets. Um, and so the first thing I wanna point out is this red color. Um, so that was this copepod, Neocalamus cristatus, this large, juicy, vertically, well, barely vertically migrating um, copepod. And you can see that at, during the day we found them um, at 50 to 100 meters, and at night we found them in the surface. And we thought, great, there's this huge biomass of this big, juicy copepod. There's going to be a lot of fecal pulp production by this guy. Um, we'll see some really cool... Uh, potential passive carbon flux from them. But what was really fascinating was if you look at this plot here, these are the different individual species we looked into. And you can see Neocalanus cristatus here, um, and it's daytime fecal pellet carbon production rate on the left in the lighter bar versus at night in the darker bar, and it's a relatively low rate. Um, and so what we found is they were producing not a lot of fecal pellets, and in fact, um, we think we also had some grazing rate measurements and they weren't really doing much at all. And so what we think is that they were preparing to go into diapause. Um, and so Debbie um, mentioned ontogenetic vertical migration. So these copepods spend a large portion of the year essentially hibernating at depth, but they were up in the surface when we were there, but the time of year was right so that we think we caught them right before they went down. Um, and physiologically, they actually do shrink their guts up and potentially stop feeding before going into diapause. So this is kind of an odd transition time that we may have caught, but it's important when thinking about the biological carbon pump, because just, just because you have a large biomass of a particular species, you have to take into consideration its life history strategy in order to draw a conclusion about its contribution to, um, in this case, passive carbon flux. So salps have also already been mentioned, but they're a gelatinous um, pelagic tunicate. And um, here we see them in this bucket here. So this is the 400 to 500 meter depth. And so um, during the day, they were migrating several hundred meters deep. And then at night, boop, they were coming up to the surface um, to feed. And they were producing these gigantic fecal pellets. Um, and per individual, you can see on this plot, here's our Salpa Aspera bar. Salpa Aspera was by far, per individual, the biggest pooper that we saw. <laughs> um, and so these are production rates in the surface waters, and we were fortunate enough to be able to compare these directly to sediment trap collections at 100 meters, um, done by Colleen Durkin and her group on this cruise. Um, and you can see this is this has lots of different types of material um, that was caught throughout the cruise. So we did three sampling cycles, which is one, two, and three. So you can think of this as like the first third of the cruise, the second third, and the third third um, through time. But um, salp fecal pellets, these yellow bars, um, and then long, what we're calling long fecal pellets, these blue bars made up the majority of the fecal material that was caught in the sediment traps. Um, 
so you can see that salps were, um, when they were present, because they weren't always present, were very important to this passive flux pathway. Um, and then these long fecal pellets we think are actually made by larger, faster swimming vertical migrators like suggested shrimp and large euphosids. And those are notorious for avoiding nets. So we did not directly measure their fecal pellet production. So um, we're gonna take a step back now. So that was a very specific study in a specific location. Um, and I'm gonna talk about modeling applied to long time series over large areas, because it's great to get these point measurements of rates um, of, uh, for example, fecal pellet production or respiration. But it's also important to be able to get these large scale um, pictures of, of the biological carbon pump or estimates of it. And so satellite data is a really useful tool for doing that because you can get synoptic views of the whole world. Um, but modeling is another way that we can get at some of these questions with the very little bit of time I have left, I'm going to talk about this um, modeling paper that was applied to a long time series. Um, so the continuous plankton recorder survey in the North Atlantic has been running since the um, late 1950s. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, so it's one of the longest running large scale um, zooplankton time series in the world. It's like, I would consider it a national, I, know, it's, I guess it's an international treasure. Um, and so these, uh, at the redder the color is on this plot, the more samples we have um, over time. So these are all the different tracks that have been sampled for many, many decades. Um, and then uh, a group of us applied a model of both um, of active flux and passive fecal pellet flux um, or export to this time series using this kind of schematic that I already mentioned. And so here's what we found. Um, this is change um, on, on the top left here. This is change in the flux of fecal pellet carbon produced by covapods specifically in the continuous plankton recorder time series since 1960. Um, and so you can see that there are areas where it's increased and actually areas, a lot of areas where it's decreased. Um, and then this is Similarly, the change in active carbon flux due to vertical migration by copepods in that data set, and it looks really similar. Um, on the right here, you can see we've uh, sort of zeroed in on certain areas that were really, really well sampled by that time series. And you can see that this pattern isn't consistent across the whole North Atlantic, obviously, by these maps. You can see that as well. But in some places, flux of carbon from these copepods has gone down, in some places it's gone up. And so um, what we found in the end is that it's actually due to the change in distribution of this large um, calanine copepod, calanus finmar chickus. And so um, the point I want to make here quickly is that um, the changing distribution and community composition of zooplankton on this really massive scale over many decades does have a very real impact on the amount of carbon that can be sequestered in the ocean by these um, biological processes. So with that, I will say thank you very much for having me and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Karen. Um, we do have one question from Arthur. Um, he says, zooplankton can use vertical migration to control their position with the tides in an estuary, but of course their poop can't do the same. In estuary systems, would we expect to see a general trend towards the sea of estuary and zoop poop? <laughs> can you, sorry, I don't understand what the actual question is. Um, Transition, Arthur, oh, towards the sea, like in space, horizontally. Arthur, do you want to chime in? Yeah, that's my general question. Basically, would we, the, the copepods can stay in the estuary, but would we see that carbon that they're pooping out just move out towards the sea with the tides? It depends how quickly it sinks, right? And in relation to the tidal cycle, I would say. Um, and whether the tide's coming in or out. And I don't know a ton about zooplankton in tidal estuaries, so it's a really great question that I'd like to think about more if after your talk, or no, there's a talk about tides, I think, not yours, but yeah. So I don't know, it depends on the, um, like I said, the sinking rate relative to the 
the tidal movement. OK, I think uh, Ted has his hand raised. Yeah, I have, maybe it's kind of a, a similar question, um, but uh, I was wondering if, you know, like I was thinking from a, a water chemistry perspective, if that, you know, estuarine versus marine, if you would expect things to clump better because in like a high ionic strength solution, you know, like the fecal pellets might bind together in kind of a saltier water in the, the ocean versus a more dilute water in, uh, in an estuary, if that would make mm -hmm. much of a difference. You know, to be honest, I think it's a really good question thinking about the difference of those two environments, but I would think it would be the opposite for a slightly different reason. Um, and that's that there's so much suspended um, like tep and like particulate material and sea dot, like there's just a lot of goop in estuaries compared to the open ocean. And so, um, and we do see this, I believe during blooms in the open ocean where you have a lot of tap produced by phytoplankton as they're getting um, less and less robust, um, that that actually makes the fecal pellets clump together with other particles. And so I think that you might actually see more um, kind of clumping together and aggregating of material in estuaries just because of the amount of other stuff that's suspended. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, I think we are at break time. Um, Sam, are we going till 10, 10? Uh, yeah, so let's all come back, um, like Christina said, at 10, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And thanks so much, everyone. Those were three really fantastic talks. It's great to be here with over 100 zooplankton enthusiasts. <laughs> Thanks for joining us.
All right, everyone, it says 1010 on my clock right now, so I figured we can go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Arthur. I am going to be facilitating the next section. And so if we can uh, go ahead and get Wim slide up, that would be great. But our next speaker, if everyone can hear me, is uh, Wim Kimmerer, who's a research professor at the Estuary and Ocean Science Center at San Francisco State University. So I will go ahead and pass it off to Wim. Thank you. Arthur, is my slide showing? Yes, I see your PowerPoint. They are not yet in presenter mode, though. How's that? Perfect. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Arthur, and thanks, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Um, really happy to see sort of a bunch of my uh, my colleagues here on this uh, in these presentations. Um, so my topic is uh, <clears throat> is physical habitat for zooplankton. And I refer to like in a moving frame of reference, and I'll explain what I mean by that. But um, most of this will be estuarine, and most of it will be um, about copepods. Um, so, first of all, um, let me get my pointer there. I'm really happy for once not to have to use fish food as my definition is open, and rather to focus on the actual organisms. Um, so this is my, these are my topics, talk about this moving frame of reference, about injection and dispersion. Uh, plankton is approximately Lagrangian particles, meaning they move with the water. <clears throat> How a population can maintain itself in an estuary under those conditions, and then some habitat attributes and how they inter interact. Um, and then modeling retention, which we've done a lot of here, and finally uh, retention and movement. And then finally talk about uh, salinity as a habitat attribute. So here we are in the San Francisco estuary. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the place, uh, it's, a, um, it's a it's a large estuary that's Kind of river dominated has uh, almost meso meso tidal, almost two meter tidal range, <laughs> and it's uh, it consists of a series of uh, wide basins, shallow basins, with a deep channel running between them, and then in between where the coast where the, the bay cuts through the coast range, we have really narrow channels that are incised very deeply, and these are really important for the longitudinal circul and vertical circulation of water and therefore organisms in the estuary. And just to give you the, the locations we're talking about, Sassoon Bay, the Delta up in this area, Tarquina Strait, one of these narrow places, and San Pablo Bay. These are mainly where I'll, where I'll be talking about. San Francisco Bay, strictly speaking, is Central Bay and South Bay. And we'll be talking about copepods, which make up about 94% uh, of the zooplankton larger than 150 microns. Um, these... Uh, so some key concepts for the plankton. Um, the travel time from the Delta to Central Bay um, in winter, in the, in the wet season, um, the, the median uh, travel time is about 10 days. In the summer, median travel time is about 140 days, which essentially it's all summer. So it's essentially almost infinite. And <clears throat> at least from a, from a plankton's perspective. So here we have, um, I want to talk a little bit about advection and dispersion. So advection is a consequence of the net river flow going through the estuary. And, um, and, and it carries stuff and organisms with it. So I gave you a time scale for that travel time. And it's, it's short in the winter and essentially negligible in the summertime. Um, Whereas dispersion is there all the time, and that's driven by the tides. The tidal flow rates are much higher than the, than the net flow rates most of the time <clears throat> and in most of the estuary. 
And what dispersion does is it takes a, a concentration of stuff in organisms and it shreds them and spreads them out. And this, this picture doesn't do justice because it really is shredded. It's like when you put the, uh, you put the, the cream in the coffee and you start to stir it. And at first it's just a bunch of swirls before it gets mixed. Um, and the important thing is to note about this, first of all, are, are that this uh, dispersion takes, takes particles and organisms from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. And also um, that results in a removal from the, from the population, the source population, and a subsidy to areas of, of low concentration. And, and again, dispersion is not as neat and pretty as this picture might imply. So this is a, a, just a kind of an arbitrary selected uh, cross section of the estuary. So this is, this is up in Sassoon Bay, that's where it is. And it's about 7,000 meters wide and about 12 meters deep at the most. And this is exaggerated. Um, in the vertical 200 fold. We do this all the time when we show cross sections like this. Um, if we don't do it, we get something like this. And actually, this is still exaggerated in the vertical by tenfold. When I try to exaggerate it, not at all, you couldn't see the line. So basically, what we have here is a very thin veneer of water on top of an irregular bottom. And so the vertical dimension is, is, is fundamentally different from the horizontal dimension. Um, and if you take a one millimeter copepod like this one, this is our lab rat, um, and, and you, you whoops, think about, um, you think about how fast they move. Um, they can move something like about a body length per second for, for a long period of time. From the bottom to the top, that's about three hours. South to north, it's about eight days. So forget about it. They're not going, they, they, their swimming is, is going to be negligible when you compare that to um, horizontal movements of, um, on the order of, of, well, let's say hundreds to thousands of times as fast as this guy can swim. So, um, <clears throat> so that means that effectively they're, they're, they're passive particles except for their ability to move vertically. So this little animation um, is just to illustrate if I can get it to run. Well, maybe I can't. Can anybody else get it to run? Let me uh, try something different here. Um, well, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do here is make this. <laughs> try to make this thing run. She's tricking me. And jeez. <laughs> well, I don't know how to do this. Um, let me try it down here. No, it's not going. Um, we well, might need to turn off the, the laser pointer. What? Sorry? You might need to turn off the laser pointer function to be able to play it. Yeah, let me turn that. Okay, yeah, good idea. Okay, so these particles um, are... Uh, oops. Not doing anything anymore. Let's try again. So they're kind of bopping back and forth with the tides. These are three particles in a particle tracking model. And as they move around, you can see they kind of wiggle this way and that way, and that's not terribly impressive. Um, but um, after a little while, and I'm going to I'm going to sort of grab this and speed it up a little bit. After a little while, they kind of get stuck. They're not really stuck; they're still moving. But uh, but then I keep losing this thing. Um, then watch that particle, 358. And take a look at how it how it goes, and then it just kind of zips really fast 
comes down here to Carquinez Strait where it's deep and it kind of stays there just going back and forth for the rest of the animation. It's a four minute animation, so I'm going to speed it up here a little bit. And you can see those particles stay put on the right. And then and this one starts moving. And it also goes down. Fine by into the main channel and down into Carquinez Strait. And a bit later, this one starts moving. And it gets it gets down there. So now that all the particles are going to be down on the Carquinez Strait, pretty near each other. And the, the point of this is that the mixing process, this dispersion, is really irregular, especially in a really bathymetrically complex location such as this one. And so this is where this is where zooplankton live. These particles are are really useful in representing how zooplankton move. All right. So I mentioned that um, that that the uh, well the the estuary is, is say it's in a Mediterranean climate, so we have a really wet winter and really dry summers. Um, and so flow really makes a big difference. So at moderately low flows, um, we see that the salinity patterns are are like this, so where we have fresh water in the gray up in the delta. Sassoon Bay is mostly in the <clears throat> in the 0.5 to 6 range, which we call the low salinity zone, or, or more or less the allogohelene zone. And you can see the, the salinity increase in going seaward. And under high flow, this is uh, these are real flows, historical flows. You see that the uh, the freshwater part of the system extends all the way down to San Pablo Bay. Um, well, a few things to think about this. A bunch of things change besides just the flow and the salinity. Loading of various things, salinity, residence time, uh, the ability of the benthos to, uh, to stay put, and, and also um, the distributions of organisms, so plankton, fish, benthos on a different time scale. Um, also, when when you have these really high flows, why doesn't all the salt get pushed out of the estuary? And to, to figure that out, you have to look at the vertical. So in the vertical, um, these these are model outputs. You see um, you see at low flow, relatively low stratification, as indicated by the sloping isohalenes. And then as you increase the flow, especially when the when the salt field moves into a deep area like Tarquinia Strait you see much greater uh, stratification. What that means is that there are mechanisms related to stratification that move salt and organisms up estuary. So instead of just pushing all the water out, what you have is salt water starting to crawl in at the bottom. In the, San, in, in the Chesapeake Bay, this is kind of a permanent phenomenon. In the San Francisco estuary, it's tidally variable. And this, this uh, gravitational circulation or pumping of salt at the bottom is a huge, um, it's a really important uh, feature of the salt flux going up the estuary and also the organism flux. So how do organisms stay put? How do populations maintain themselves? Well, um, they can do so by, by just growing fast and, and just letting their propagules uh, go. And this is, this is what most phytoplankton must do. This is the original Sort of, sort of model of how organisms stay in estuaries. But a second mechanism is to use this gravitational flow, this deep average landward uh, um, flow to, uh, to move up the estuary or to, or to maintain position. A third mechanism is called tidal stream transport, where the organism goes to the bottom on the ebb and stays up in the water column in the flood. And then finally, we have tidal vertical migration where they move down on the ebb and up on the flood, but they're within the water column the whole time. Now we looked at this, and I'll show you some some data. And um, and a lot of people will infer um, retention from this behavior, but it's not it's not uh, it's not really it doesn't really demonstrate retention. Um, it, it it didn't work the way we thought. Um, I'll I'll get back to that in a bit. But then uh, we 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 now realize or we realize that the um, that the organisms have a salinity range over which they're most abundant. And 
and they're less abundant at either end. And this is Eurytimer caroliae, a very common zooplankton in the estuary. And this is um, long-term monitoring data from the New Asians Ecological Program. So if you were sitting at a point and, and observing this, um, this organism, as flow changed, you'd see salinity going up or down. Say as flow decreases during the late spring, you would see that at this point, um, as salinity increased, the abundance would decrease. And I've reversed the axis here for the, to, to make it sort of fit the estuary. So, so you'd say, well, this, this organism doesn't like salty water. However, if you were up here, you would see the opposite. It increases with salinity. So, so it does like salty water. Well, which is it? Well, it's kind of neither one because we're looking at this organism in a in an Eulerian framework, in a, in a land-based framework, it's the wrong frame of reference. The frame of reference to look at these guys in is what salinity they, they live in. That's, that's the first thing you should look at. So when you look at the means of abundance for salinity from about 0.5 to 6, you really see very little effective flow. And all the organisms in the, all the planktonic organisms in the estuary have their salinity ranges. This is actually stitched together from a couple of different data sets, but um, which makes it a little messy. But, but the point remains that there's a bunch of sort of marine-ish to, to estuarine organisms, relatively few really estuarine organisms, and then a bunch of freshwater things. So, um, so you know, a fundamental uh, ecology topic is why are things where they are and, and how do they get there? And, um, and if we look at um, these organisms in their frame of reference, we can start to, to tease this apart. Is this the effect of, uh, of salinity tolerance? And you know, there's this is modeled by uh, Mark Peterson of, of uh, habitat components where some are stationary in an estuary and some are, are dynamic or moving. And, and the, you know, these are the ones that actually move and change, and these are the ones that stay put. But I, say, I think if it, uh, for a pelagic organism, a planktonic organism, it's the opposite. These are stationary and these are moving because the, the organisms are in a moving frame of reference. They move past these features. They may change things a lot, but, they, but they're not part of their, their normal habitat. So, so these bumpy things in the estuary and, and, and things are... Or they affect how, the, how the, the water flows and therefore the organism's uh, uh, environment, but they're dynamic to the, to the plankton. So looking here at tidal migration, that topic came up in Debbie's talk. Uh, here's evidence of tidal vertical migration. Tidal velocity from left to right, positive is, is flood, and they're higher in the water column on the flood on average. Um, but again, this is not evidence of retention. This is evidence that they're moving in a, in a way that could result in retention. But, but what, does it, what does this imply for both their swimming speed and in the turbulent water column and, and for retention? Um, I'll show you some modeling results in a second. But we looked at this with, uh, we had an 80, a bottom mount of ADCP. So we had, uh, we had velocity by depth. And, and abundance by depth, we multiplied the two together and added them up, and there was no effect. In other words, um, a random position of the water column was just as good as this migration at retaining the organisms. So why was that? It turns out because this area was, was kind of shallow where we did this study. So we wrote in the paper at, uh, that to resolve this will require modeling studies of the interaction of behavior with the three-dimensional flow field. And we did them much later, much, much later. Um, so this is uh, particles released at the green area, and 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 then after 30 days, this is their, their center of mass. This is their initial center of mass, and these are passive particles, and these are particle <laughs> particles that migrate tidally, and and they hardly move. So uh, so this is evidence of retention. And here's uh, and oh, I, I forgot to mention that we tried a whole bunch of different behaviors. Uh, to see which ones would result in similar vertical positions to what we observed in the field. And, and that's the ones we used, um, and that's the behavior we used. And so this compares the final positions of in salinity space of 
of tidally migrating particles and passive particles to copepods. So most of the passive particles are gone. Tidally migrating particles pretty much match the copepod distributions. Um, somebody brought up uh, demersal migration, or I guess Debbie did, and, uh, um, and this is uh, for Pseudodaphnus forbesi, again, our lab rat. This is our station up here. One of my students did this, uh, this nice study where he did, and oh, by the way, this, this looks like dry land, but as you can see in the right, on the, in the picture, it's actually water. And so he looked at uh, day and night uh, positions in the water column. This is for nauplii, early late epipedites, adult females and adult males. And the point is that the adult females and adult males are, on, are, are not in the water column um, by day. Lake capabitites less a little bit and, and so on. Um, and he also did ponar grabs and found that yes, they are in the mud. But actually I had a student who published a paper uh, in 1985, Mark Fancy, where he was on a, on a different pseudodapnus species in Australia. And he showed that they actually stick to particles on the bottom. So I'm a little over here. I'm going to skip this um, and talk a little bit about uh, salinity, uh, uh, salinity tolerance. And does it explain the zooplankton uh, um, distributions? And this is Karen Kafetz's work. She showed that uh, these organisms were highly tolerant to a wide range of salinities. Uh, in terms of their uh, the nauplii survival, the adults less so, but the hatching success and eggs per clutch were very um, were very uh, even across the range of salinity up to twelve. But here's their their uh, distribution. Um, ignore the colors for the moment. The white line shows the center of mass, and the, and the salinity on the right scale. So their center of mass early in this piece was uh, about at, at about 0.8 salinity, and and that's well below their tolerance. We think it's because of predation on the nauplii by, by this clam. And then this copepod here, Carchiella sinensis, introduced in 1993, made that worse, and they, they shifted up estuary to a lower salinity. So here's my summary, and uh, I'm not going to go through it, but I'm going to show my final picture. I want to thank my very many funders, uh, Delta Science Program for the symposium, Sam and Karen. Um, uh, Labby's current and past, um, Michelle Youngbluth, Anne Slaughter, and Tony Ignacio in particular. Thank you. All right, thank you, Wim. Um, <clears throat> I see one hand up in the participants. I think, uh, Mark, you had a question? Um, a comment. Wim, I would like to thank you for that masterful overview. I realize <laughs> much of this was has been published but I would encourage you to put it together in a synthetic review paper, because for those of us who don't work in, in the San Francisco estuary or other estuaries, um, you, you have a nice framework that puts many pieces together. It would be a great place for, for people to be introduced to the system. So could you put that on your writing list, please? <laughs> yes, Mark, thanks for that. Um, I, it's a very long writing list, actually. Somewhere near the bottom of that writing list is a paper that Sammy Suisi and I were going to write eons ago. Uh, essentially, it was going to be about zooplankton and estuaries. But uh, yeah, that's that's a good stimulus. And um, maybe someday when I really retire, I'll be uh, I'll work on it. No, sooner than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we have a couple more questions or a couple more minutes left for questions. I didn't see anything in the chat and there's no hands raised, so I'm going to kind of ask a question I had. Um, in certain years, especially like 2017 in the estuary, we had super high flows going all the way out into summer. And when that salinity zone, that low salinity zone is pushed out of our survey area, for example, like the IAP zooplankton study uh, only covers a certain part of this upper estuary. When that low salinity zone is pushed out, um, is there a decent way you think of tracking whether or not those copepods that would be there typically are either low abundance or just being out of our pushed out of our survey zone? Um, well, yeah, and that's to sample for them. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you kind of have to sample where they are. Uh, we could we could model it. Um, uh, and I, I forgot to mention that Ed Gross, my co-author on it, I slipped him as a co-author um, on this, this talk. Um, he's the modeler, I'm not the modeler. But, um, you know, we could set up a model of that, but 
but uh, getting it uh, to run that long might be a challenge. And um, and I'm not sure that would really make sense. I think instead it would be a really good idea to do some sampling down there. I actually had a uh, I, I actually got IFE funding in the late 90s to do a pilot study for sampling zooplankton uh, in the lower estuaries and lower estuary and and uh, and that happened right before the pod, the pelagic organism decline, and everybody went into a big panic and started focusing on the delta. Well, guess what? Now we're thinking about longfin smelt, which uh, really don't live in the delta very much. They actually live in San Pablo Bay and, and and out in the ocean. So we should be thinking about you know figuring out where their food supply is coming from. Okay. Well, thank you, Wim. That wraps up that talk we got to move on to our next um our next speaker is angela strecker the director at the institute for watershed studies at western washington university and i will go ahead and pass it off to angela thank you okay can you hear me okay yes i can hear you okay and see your slides perfect I'm going to get a laser pointer because I think that's awesome. OK, I'd like to really thank the organizers for inviting me to present today. And um, it's been really exciting to be in, a, I guess, a virtual room full of people that love zooplankton as much as I do. So I'm going to talk about um, aquatic invasive species today. And so I'm going to start by kind of um, talking about freshwater zooplankton and as Kind of a system to understand environmental effects and um, stressors like invasive species. I'm going to move on to talking about some of the vectors and pathways of invasive freshwater zooplankton. And then I'm going to shift to focusing on a case study of Bithotrephes, which um, is an invader that I studied in my um, doctoral research. So let's get started. I'm going to focus today mostly on lentic um, plankton because that's kind of my, um, that's my wheelhouse. And so Freshwater zooplankton tend to be relatively species poor compared to marine environments and in some ways that's kind of an advantage from a study perspective is that you, know, you can go to a water body and you know not find um, more than you know, maybe one or two dozen different taxa. So that is a definite um, plus. They tend to live in pretty variable environments and um, certainly when we compare to marine environments that is true. Maybe less true of estuaries that have a lot of you know dynamic environments but we see freshwater plankton across, you know, really broad gradients of temperature, salinity, pH, and trophic status, as well as um, variable environments within, within a water body. And so if we look at, um, this is a plot from uh, Theodore Hammer, who studied salinity and zooplankton quite extensively, especially in Western lakes. And um, coincidentally, my uh, son's name is also Theodore. I promise that I did not name um, my child from, um, based on <laughs> a famous uh, zooplankton ecologist. But um, what this shows is that looking at salinity from you know, three to up to 275 grams per liter, that we see some organisms um, like Artemia that can survive a wide range. But that other, um, you know, Clodocerin and Copepod, as well as rotifers, can um, live in, you know, a broad range of different um, salinities in the environment. And so, again, showing kind of a lot of um, breadth there. They're relatively easy to sample in lakes, which is one of the reasons why I like to work on zooplankton. You can get out in a canoe or in, um, you know, inflatable raft. Um, these are some students from my lab and you can collect you know, relatively comprehensive samples as well as do experiments. And so this is another one of my students doing um, a mesocosm study at a reservoir in central Oregon. So when we talk about invasive freshwater zooplankton, um, they, you know, they move around by a lot of the same ways that other um, invasive uh, organisms move around. So they get um, dispersed by boats and boating gear, um, canals and pipelines, construction equipment, fish stocking, but probably the biggest one is ship ballast. And so they're, you know, getting picked up in one port and then when the ballast is offloaded, they are establishing in um, different ports. And so um, we can take a look. This is a, a map um, from a study done by Keller et al. looking at the Great Lakes as a, you know, essentially a, a very significant in invasion hub. And all of the circles on this map are showing um, primary connections between ports in terms of how many voyages they're making to the Great Lakes. 
So we see that, um, you know, the Great Lakes is connected to ports all over the world um, as a primary port, um, but also through secondary, tertiary, and quaternary ports. So, you know, essentially one step, two steps, and three steps removed. And so with this analysis, they show that, you know, the Great Lakes is connected in, in one way or the other um, to ports essentially all over the globe. And so this um, um, analysis really kind of confirms that we already knew that a lot of freshwater invasive species are getting first established in the Great Lakes and then, you know, are moving into more inland water bodies um, from there. Just as a kind of um, example of the ability of zooplankton to, to disperse, I want to kind of talk about a study that I did with some undergraduate students. And um, what they did is paddled a canoe for uh, approximately five minutes in a lake. So these are lakes that don't have any um, invasive species in them. But just to kind of illustrate, you know, how good zooplankton are at getting around. And after um, the five minutes, they came out and sprayed the canoe with water, collected all that water into a bucket and enumerated um, what they found. And they did this 125 times. And what they found was that over those 125 you know, replicates, essentially they're finding um, hundreds of, of individual zooplankton. And so this is kind of broken down into major taxonomic groups. And we see that there's a lot of Cytidae um, and Chidoridae, both of which tend to be more benthically oriented. So that makes sense that they're really good at um, adhering onto surfaces. Even a canoe, which we think of as being kind of a smooth surface that they shouldn't be that good at, at um, adhering to. And so um, what this meant on average that about 10 to 13 individuals were being collected off of each canoe. And that doesn't sound like a really large number, but um, in speaking to this room full of experts, I know you know that um, there's a lot of zooplankton that are um, parthenogenic, at least seasonally. And so they can establish populations in theory from a single individual. So what this means is that potentially, um, you know, this is one way that zooplankton are getting around um, in, in the environment. So this is an analysis that I did um, about 10 years ago for um, a book chapter that um, looked at global freshwater invasive species. And um, this uh, chapter was focused just on Clodocerans. Um, Jeff Cordell, uh, who I saw mentioned in, in the previous talk, um, he uh, wrote the chapter on copepods. And so this is showing the um, invasion of species from different zoogeographic regions. And so we have five um, invasions that went from the Paleoarctic to the Nearctic, um, three that kind of went the reverse direction, and then just um, small numbers of individuals moving kind of between other zoogeographic regions. And so we see um, that the, the bulk of the invasions are kind of happening in the Northern um, hemisphere. However, this is of course highly biased by both shipping traffic um, as I showed with the Great Lakes Invasion Hub example, um, as well as just, you know, sampling effort. The, a lot more sampling effort is put into kind of more, these more northern hemisphere lakes. And if anyone has a question about this one, um, so this is actually an invasion from a, um, a sub-Antarctic um, island to uh, Easter Island of, of a species of Alana. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears to talk about bithotrephes. Um, there's been some debate and confusion about what um, its actual species name is. So I think Longimanus may now be out of date, um, but uh, the common name for it is the spiny water flea. Um, some may also be familiar with uh, its kind of close relative and the fish hook water flea, and that they both have these kind of long spines with barbs on them. And these barbs are um, a really great morphology in terms of sticking, being really sticky and sticking to things like ropes and, and fishing lines. It's relatively small, um, as you can kind of see from, from this. Um, it was native to Eurasia and arrived in the Great Lakes in the early 1980s. And so it's probably one of the earlier um, zooplankton to invade the Great Lakes. As I mentioned, it has this unique morphology. Um, and this is important for lots of reasons. Uh, one of which that this um, spine is actually you know, uh, relatively sharp, probably not to us as people, but um, to uh, fish that consume um, bithotrephes, it can actually puncture their stomachs um, as well as form boluses in their stomachs. And so they learn to avoid eating it, especially when they're younger and the younger, smaller fish will avoid um, eating it altogether. 
And so what this means is that it, it acts as kind of an energetic dead end and that it consumes, a, you know, a lot of zooplankton, as I'll show you, but it um, doesn't get consumed by a lot of other um, uh, trophic or upper trophic level species. It has a pretty uh, broad environmental tolerance and um, is seasonally parthenogenic, so meaning that it's going to switch between sexual and asexual reproduction. Of course, that's really significant from an invasion perspective because the um, the uh, asexual uh, resting eggs or diapausing eggs can survive outside of water and um, allow it to establish new populations, even if they are moved outside of water. And so here's a good example of this is a fish line and you see, you know, literally hundreds of um, bithotrevies on that on that line. As a kind of um, illustration of its spread, um, this is uh, looking at from the early, you know, mid 1980s to 2006, looking at the number of lakes that it had invaded in um, Ontario um, from the Great Lakes where it was first established. And we see that there's kind of the slow growth over time um, and then kind of an exponential kind of uptick in invasions. And certainly some of this was because of increased attention. And so there was, um, there was a, a group of several scientists, myself included, that did some pretty comprehensive studies on this in the 2000s. And we definitely detected, um, found some new detections of the species in lakes where it hadn't been um, demonstrated to be living in before. So, you know, it goes from zero to over a hundred in, in not a very long period of time. So this map, um, this was again in the chapter that I was talking about. So this is a little bit out of date, but shows the um, distribution in the US and those are the white circles and then in Canada and those are the black circles. And so certainly Ontario was kind of the early invasion front for this species, but it has moved to a number of um, states. Um, and so at the time that I did this, um, there was about 200 uh, lakes and rivers that had been invaded. Um, I did just last week a kind of a quick update of this and there's now about 300 invaded systems. And um, we see that it's kind of expanded its range in Michigan, Minnesota, New York, um, definitely in Ontario and Wisconsin as well. So one of the qu big questions with um, invasive species is, can we predict where they are going to um, establish? And so um, I modeled uh, the vulnerability of lakes across the US to Bithotrephes invasion using a discriminant function model from uh, Hugh McIsaac, who's been, uh, who's kind of a really done a great work in terms of looking at invasions in uh, the Great Lakes and beyond. And I did this using the National Lakes Assessment um, from the US EPA, which is a massive survey, um, almost 1200 lakes. And these lakes were chosen from a statistical design that was um, meant to survey a range of lake types and be representative of, you know, lake types in um, a range of lake types in that region. So it's kind of a perfect data set for this type of question. And so the model um, that I used is, uh, I'm not going to go too deep into here, but to kind of highlight some of the factors that are important, including um, water clarity, so tends to prefer clear lakes, um, larger lakes, um, but this might be a function of the fact that larger lakes tend to get more boater traffic and have boat launches when we know that's one of the ways that they get around. Um, deeper lakes, as well as lakes that have lower chlorophyll, and that kind of goes along with the Secchi um, value there. And so I'm going to kind of skip a couple steps, but essentially this generates a lake score that gives us kind of a, you know, likelihood of, um, of invasion or habitat vulnerability. And um, this is all of the lakes and reservoirs in the National Lakes Assessment. Um, and so the um, white circles are showing locations that are not vulnerable to invasion and the black are showing um, the ones that are vulnerable to invasion. Um, and I kind of separated lakes that had a boat launch from those who did not um, to kind of highlight that those are at you know, a very high invasion risk compared to maybe a little bit more moderate invasion risk in the triangles. And so all told um, across the US, um, the, the lakes that are in the database, about 20% of them were vulnerable to invasion. And you know, we can kind of be a little arm wavy and then based on the study design of the National Lakes Assessment, scale that up and say, 20% of lakes um, across regions are vulnerable to invasion. 
And what this kind of looks like if we look within um, major watersheds is that, you know, almost all areas in the U.S. have some vulnerability to this um, invasion by the species, except for maybe the lower Colorado um, in the south and, and southeast, um, with, you know, um, obviously pretty high vulnerability in the Great Lakes region, and that's kind of where we see them mostly right now, but also in the west, um, in the west coast, and that's something I think um, to keep an eye on in the years to come. Okay, so I want to talk um, a little bit more now about how Bithotrephes affects native communities. And um, this is work that we went out and surveyed. Um, it was supposed to be 20 lakes, but so, um, six of those lakes were actually invaded. Um, so we ended up with 10 invaded lakes and four non-invaded lakes. And we looked at um, species richness um, of uh, total zooplankton. So the invaded lakes are in the green, non-invaded in the blue. And we found there was a significant decline in species richness of clodosaurans, but not really of copepods. And so that's kind of in line with what other people had found in terms of um, which groups of, of species were most affected. We look at abundance, we see kind of a similar trend that clodosaurian abundance is significantly negatively impacted in um, or lower in lakes that are invaded compared to lakes that are not invaded. We were also interested in what this would mean for kind of more ecosystem function types of questions. And so we took some stratified samples from lakes, although not with nearly as cool of a net as um, Deborah was showing earlier, that uh, net looked really amazing. But um, we just used a really simple closing net to get samples from the epilimnion, metalimnion, and hypolimnion um, of lakes. And we did this for a subset of the lakes that I showed before. And we looked at zooplankton um, production, so biomass production. And um, what we found over the course of um, part of spring and all, you know, pretty much all of summer was that the invaded lakes in the green were significantly, had significantly lower biomass production compared to the non-invaded lakes. And this pattern is um, coincides pretty nicely with when Bithotrephes starts to become abundant um, in these lakes. So we see with these diamonds are showing the abundance here and that, you know, um, they are somewhat temperature limited. So it takes a while for them to kind of ramp up um, their, their um, hatching and, and reproduction. But and they start becoming abundant is when we see kind of the big decline um, in zooplankton biomass production that stays that way for the rest of the summer. So I kind of want to wrap up by talking about uh, context dependence. And um, we had observed in, in our work that Bithotrephes has very high consumption rates. And others had, had noted this before as well. And so this graph shows, it's a little bit um, noisy, but um, I'll just kind of walk you through it. And so the gray diamonds are the zooplankton um, uh, production. The black squares are the Bithotrephes consumption. And so we see that on these dates with the stars, the asterisks, that um, Bithotrephes consumption is exceeding zooplankton production, often by a fair amount. And so if you kind of put that in context, this is, you know, one individual species that's consuming all of the um, zooplankton production in, in this lake. And this is at Harp Lake, which is a really well-studied um, lake. And then those white triangles are showing kind of um, the, how the abundance changes through the year. And so if we look at summer, we see that Bithotrephes is consuming about 50% of zooplankton production. Um, and if we move that, you know, open up that window to earlier in the year, we see that it's more like, you know, a quarter to a fifth of um, zooplankton production is being consumed by um, this invasive species. So that's a lot. So we hypothesize that this might lead to a trophic cascade in lakes. So, you know, with a reduced so plankton community, especially of cladocerans, which are, you know, our key grazers, that we would see increased phytoplankton. And so, um, you know, this is, I'm going to kind of give a hint of what's to come, but at the time, the invader was found almost exclusively in oligotrophic low productivity lakes. So to answer this question, um, we did a cubitainer experiment um, where we incubated um, zooplankton communities from invaded lakes. This is just kind of showing with cartoons that, you know, lower abundance, lower um, richness, and um, fewer cladocerans compared to a non-invaded lake. So we incubated those um, cubitainers 
um, for a period of three days. And so we measured chlorophyll um, as a kind of our proxy of, of um, grazing pressure. And so we incubated those um, and then measured chlorophyll again at the end. And what we hypothesized is that we would see a lot of algal growth in the invaded lakes because essentially the lack of top-down control. Um, and for once, uh, our hypothesis was right on. Um, that's exactly what we saw. Um, this axis is a little wonky, um, so it's percent algae grazed. And so essentially, if you're above the line, it means that algae were grazed down. If you're below the line, it means that the al the algal there was algal growth. And we find that in the invaded lakes, there was um, a significant growth of algae through the course of the summer um, in a small number of lakes that we were able to do the experiment in. But as you are probably noticing, that um, percent algae grazed, so you know, two percent to you know maybe um, four percent of uh, of chlorophyll in a low productivity lake is very very small. That's a, just a very small um, effect. And so um, th this also didn't translate to effects at the whole lake scale. And so it was you know interesting, but not really um, you know biologically meaningful. So uh, scroll forward about, you know, 10, um, I guess less than 10 years and Bithotrephes invaded Lake Mendota in Wisconsin in about 2008, 2009. And this is a eutrophic lake, which is very different from most of the, almost all the other lakes that Bithotrephes was found in. It's also an LTER site um, and so has data going back to the 1990s. So um, a very, um, a keen graduate student was working, um, Jake Walsh was working on this data and did some, some great, um, great work to show that um, but the trephies could precipitate a lot of changes in, um, in like food webs. And so looking first at um, Daphnia pulicaria, what they found, and this is a log scale, so um, that's worth noting that, um, and then looking kind of over multiple pre-invasion years and multiple post-invasion years, um, they observed about a 60% decline in Daphnia abundance. And this translated to about a one meter um, decline in water clarity. So the water um, clarity pre-invasion was you know, decent for a eutrophic lake, but um, it actually got worse um, because of algal, you know, more algae not being grazed by zooplankton. And so what was really cool about the studies is that they took it a, a step further and kind of linked it in this broader context of ecosystem services. And that, you know, when you have this invader, it's, you know, it's interacting with your keystone grazers, Daphnia, um, it's affecting water quality um, through water clarity. It's potentially affecting, um, you know, the apertrophic levels um, in a system that is highly reliant on, you know, recreational fishing. And what they estimated was this this loss of water clarity associated with Bithotrephes invasion was valued at about $140 million. So this um, kind of illustrates a couple of things that, you know, um, invasive zooplankton can and do have big effects on ecosystem services in, in, you know, in lakes and probably lots of other systems as well. And the context dependence really matters. We see that this um, organism had a much bigger effect in a eutrophic system compared to an oligotrophic system. Okay, so I just wanna wrap up by saying that, um, you know, we know that invasive freshwater zooplankton have the potential to spread widely. They just, their biology is really um, quite excellent for being um, dispersed. Um, and this can have significant effects on the lower food web, but also potentially on the upper food web. And that the context of invasion really matters. And so we really need to be looking across a wide range of different water bodies to understand the effects and potential spread of invaders. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, Dr. Shelley Arnold, my uh, PhD advisor and uh, lifelong mentor. I uh, hope everyone has someone like that in their corner, as well as um, a large number of field assistants and lab mates that helped with this study. And happy to take questions. Thank you, Angela. That was a great talk. Um, we have time for maybe one question before we move on to the next, uh, but we do have multiple questions in the chat that if you have a chance, if you could answer, that'd be great. I'm gonna, ask uh, from Deborah Steinberg, uh, maybe she missed this, but what consumes bithotrephes and keeps the population in check in its habitat of origin? Oh, and its habitat of origin. Um, it, it, I think it is consumed there by some small um, planktivorous fish that, you know, have co-evolved to be able to tolerate um, the spine. That's my understanding. Um, 
and it certainly doesn't seem to have, you know, caused the the um, effects in its native range that it does, um, it, that it has been causing in its introduced range. And um, several people have kind of hypothesized that that's just a lack of coevolutionary history. And that, um, but that zooplankton in the introduced range are actually adapting, you know, relatively quickly in terms of um, behavioral modifications, migrating away from them. Um, that's kind of one of the key ones that um, have allowed them to kind of maintain some stasis. Okay, thanks so much. I think there's a couple more questions in the chat specifically about chlorophyll in the guts, but we're going to go ahead and move on to our next talk. Our next speaker is, of course, the fantastic Rosemary Hartman, who is the is an environmental program manager at the California Department of Water Resources. Rosie, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you very much. I'm just absolutely thrilled with this whole session. Um, it's really uh, exciting to hear so many people happy to talk about zooplankton. Um, and as uh, Arthur said, I am an environmental program manager at the Department of Water Resources, but um, much of the work I'm presenting was uh, designed and executed by the Fish Restoration Program team at CDFW. Um, much of it when I was uh, working there. So um, I'm going to be saying we a lot when it, I should be saying they, but uh, you'll get the picture. Um, and so we're here to talk about differences in zooplankton communities between habitat types. I'd like to just start off with um, my acknowledgments doing them first uh, so that I don't shortchange them. Huge thank you to the Fish Restoration Program team, Stacy, Christy, Dan and Michelle in particular for letting me to continue to work with this data. Uh, big thanks to Trishel Temple, April, and Arthur for the excellent data that IEP collects. Thanks to the Zopsense team for helping figure out how to put all this data together. And a huge thank you to the field and lab crews who actually collected all the zooplankton. So talking about differences in zooplankton between different habitat types is a little bit tricky because as Wim very wisely pointed out, um, zooplankton habitat, they move with the water, right? So they um, aren't really stuck to a particular physical place in an estuary system. However, there are enough complications in a complex estuary that you would expect to see some differences um, certainly across the salinity gradient, but also in you know, shallow water versus steep water, wetlands versus open water habitat. So this talk is kind of looking at those differences between shallow versus open water habitat in um, the Bay Delta. And most of the habitat currently available in the Delta is this channel habitat. So, um, we have water that moves up and down with the tides, relatively high nutrients, relatively low production. Um, and the tides move the water up and down. They don't really activate new habitat. There isn't much shallow water. There's a lot of riprap, not a ton of vegetation. And I like to think of this as like the inner city. So um, lots of tall buildings, but it's a bit of a food desert. You know, you've got like maybe Twinkies at the local bodega, but good grocery stores are kind of hard to come by. The other habitat type that we have a lot of in the Delta are diked wetlands that are managed mostly as duck clubs. Um, kind of a unique habitat type that I feel like isn't found in many other places, but we have these flooded ponds um, that are flooded in the winter. And we have a seasonal release of everything in those ponds. They tend to have very high production, but fish can't actually access them. That production only gets out into the rest of the environment on a seasonal basis. I like to think of this like a, you know, industrial farm. Lots of production, but it's only really available when it's harvested, which is only during a certain season. And, you know, farmers don't really like just anyone going in and picking. It's not really available to most of the population. Whereas a tidal wetland will allow fish to access the productive shallow water area um, 
on a daily basis. Nutrients and fish move into the wetland and productivity will move out into the channel. So this is more like a community garden where you know things are in season year round, different vegetables, and it's a community effort. So anyone can go in and plant their crops and uh, get some food. We also have some muted tidal wetlands, which are similar to tidal wetlands, but um, they often don't have complete tidal flow. There'll be a blockage or you know an incomplete breach of a levee that restricts the tide from fully exchanging every tidal cycle. So we have a lot of the you know city habitat and not a lot of the country habitat, and this has caused problems for native fish. I know I'm sorry I mentioned fish, but it is kind of the impetus behind this particular study. Uh, the California Eco Restore uh, effort is an effort to restore tidal wetlands and other fish habitat, uh, and the Fish Restoration Program is a collaborative. Um, program between the Department of Water Resources and the Department of Fish and Wildlife to restore tidal wetlands specifically for salmon and smelt habitat. So as a part of doing all this restoration, we want to see whether it actually worked the way we expected it to, whether it actually caused this boost of production and gave fish access to the highly productive habitat. So as part of that, the Fish Restoration Program monitoring team has been going out and catching zooplankton, benthic invertebrates, uh, measuring vegetation, all kinds of stuff. And uh, the aspect that I'm going to be talking about today is in terms of how we, what differences we see between the tidal wetland habitats and other habitats in terms of zooplankton. So are zooplankton more dense in certain habitat types? Uh, do some zooplankton taxa specialize in certain habitat types? And then how do zooplankton communities change along with salt to fresh ecocline? So Sassoon Marsh is going to be a little bit salty, up in the delta, totally fresh. Uh, to test this, um, we focused mostly on the spring, because that's when juvenile salmon are moving through the system and when the delta smelts are spawning. Um, and we sampled zooplankton in these channels in the tidal habitats in March and April um, for three years, 2017, 2018, 2019. And this is continuing today, and, but I'm just showing the results of these first three years of data. So the fish restoration program towed um, zooplankton in shallow waters in either the edges of these wetlands or the tidal channels. And they have this network of different um, wetland sites, some of which are fully tidal. Um, these are either reference sites or post-restoration sites. We also have some diked wetlands where we're collecting pre-restoration data, as well as muted tidal wetlands, again, pre-restoration data. Um, and I should point out that one of the sites, Decker Island, we have both pre-restoration and post-restoration data, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, but we also want to look at channel habitat. And the fish restoration program could go out and collect their own zooplankton. But there are a lot of surveys, as we learned yesterday, already collecting zooplankton in the channels. So instead of collecting new zooplankton, we're just gonna use the data that the 20 millimeter survey collects all over the estuary in the spring, and the environmental monitoring program collects in a slightly narrower footprint year round. We put all of these different stations and um, sample types together into a kind of block design where we have these five regions. And within each region, we have channel sites, we have tidal wetland sites, and we have either diked or muted, muted tidal wetland sites. Um, you'll notice our design isn't completely balanced. We don't have the same number of sites in each region. Um, some sites we have all diked, some sites we have, um, or sorry, some sites we have channel, tidal, and diked, some sites we have channel, tidal, and muted, but um, this at least is giving us uh, a preliminary look at the differences between these habitat types. So we've got all of our data. We've got all of our habitat types, but um, as we talked about yesterday, the data from 20 millimeter survey and EMP are in different formats. They have different levels of taxonomic resolution, 
And when the fish restoration program started to put them together, it was pretty complicated and we weren't quite sure how to do it right. Fortunately, the zooplankton synthesis team and Sam's wonderful uh, shiny web application allowed us to just download all of the EMP fish restoration program and 20 millimeter data from March and April of 2017 through 2019 in one go and have it all be in the same format, same level of taxonomic resolution. We did lose some data because fish restoration in particular identified a lot of bugs that the other groups didn't, but this will give us a first look at things. So first off, we were wondering, okay, are zooplankton more dense in certain habitat types? The answer is yes, but it's complicated. On this graph, I have the five regions. Um, let's grab my laser pointer. Got the five regions, Cache, Confluence, Sacramento, San Joaquin, Sassoon Bay, Sassoon Marsh, going from fresh to salty across your screen. And the pink bars are channel sites, green, blue are muted tidal and purple are tidal. First off, you see we have huge variation in CPUE. Not particularly surprising. We know zooplankton are highly variable. But in some cases, the diked wetland sites are extremely high in catch. Sometimes not though, like over here. Uh, they're so high in catch, so we actually have to put them on a different scale in order to see them. It just swamps out everything else. So some of these are really, really highly productive. However, remember that fish can't actually access that production. To test the uh, results here statistically, we ran a generalized linear mixed model uh, testing site type, region of the estuary, and year with site as a random effect. And we found some differences, not a ton of significant differences because of the high variation, but we found that dike sites did come out statistically higher in total zooplankton catch. And we found that the confluence region had slightly lower catch than the other regions, and Sassoon Marsh had slightly higher catch than the other regions. Um, Cash, Sacramento, San Joaquin, and Sassoon Bay were all about the same. So that's the total CPUE. Tells us what has higher catch overall. But let's look at community composition. So looking at the relative percent composition of different zooplankton taxa within these different um, habitat types. So we have a similar graph here, the, three, the five regions going across the top. Within each region, we have channel sites, dike sites, muted wetland, muted tidal, and then fully tidal sites. And uh, the biggest trends you can see here is as we go from fresh water on the left to more salty water on the right, is uh, the purple bars get smaller. Purple bars are Cladocera. And I think it's pretty well known Cladocera tend to be more common in fresh water, less common in the brackish water. Um, we also can see that in some of these diked sites, we have pretty different composition. The rest of them kind of look a little bit similar, but if we cone in on the dike sites, there's one here, which is all Cadocera. And then this one over here in Sassoon Bay with this big pink bar, those are all harpacticoids. We hardly saw any harpacticoids in any other sample, but there was a ton there. So definitely a lot of variation in those dike sites. To see whether there were statistically any differences between these sites, um, we ran a permutational multivariate analysis of variance uh, using the same predictors as for our CPUE model, site type, region, year, and site. And we did find significant effects of each of these. However, it didn't explain a lot of the variation. We just made this quick pie chart of the R squared. So that's how much, um, how good the fit of each, how much of the variation each of these terms explains. And you see like the individual site explained 13% of the variation, site type only explained 8%, region 10%, year hardly anything at all. Most of this is in the who knows category, which means it's pretty variable and there weren't a ton of really strong differences in between most of these predictors. I do want to quickly point out that, um, as I said, we had to drop a lot of critters out of our data when we combined the data because not everyone uh, counted all of them. And if we look at just the fish restoration program sampling, which counted more critters than the other ones, 
Um, we had more interesting things going on, in particular ostracods, which were really common in some of the dite sites and not the other sites. Also chlembolins, which were much more common in the muted tidal and tidal sites than the channel sites. So loved, I'm really excited about diving into that data a little further later on, but not today. So again, Permanova just tells you things are different. I always like to know, well, what's different? So I ran a joint species distribution model and looking at this plot, um, all of these critters are on the Y axis and the predictor values or predictor um, variables are on the X axis. Red squares means there was a significant positive association between that species and that um, predictor variable. Blue squares means there was a significant negative association between the species and the predictor variable. A white square means it wasn't significant or there was no association. Um, so we saw that even though, it, again, this isn't a huge amount of the variation, so um, it's not telling us a lot, but there is a um, slightly more um, juvenile cyclopoid copepods and chlorosera in the channel habitat and a few more other copepods and rotifers. Diked wetlands had more harpactocoids and juvenile cyclopoids, and a few more adult cyclopoids, fewer calanoid copepods. Tidal wetlands had a few more calanoid copepods, few less cladocerans, not very strong though. And then muted tidal wetlands, again, not very strong, but a few more rotifers and a few less juvenile calanoid copepods. Looking across the estuary, the freshwater regions tended to have more copepods, cladocerans, and rotifers. And the more salty Sassoon Martian Bay had more barnacle nauplii and juvenile cyclopoids, fewer cladocera. So, to sum up, um, are zooplankton more dense in certain habitat types? Well, yeah, we found that diked wetlands tend to have more zooplankton. However, remember that they also have less water, so um, the total amount of zooplankton might be about the same, and a fish can't access that production. It was also extremely variable, so hard to make real clear um, conclusions. Uh, are zooplankton, or do some zooplankton taxa specialize in certain habitat types? A little bit. We found some associations, but not really as much as we were expecting. So this is where um, I'm excited to you know, continue this monitoring for future years to see whether we just need higher replication to see if we can find some of these things. Um, but the biggest story we did see was that the diked wetlands had a lot more variation than the tidal wetlands. This kind of tells us that the tides do a pretty good job at distributing zooplankton, connecting them between the channels and the wetland habitats. Obviously the dike wetlands aren't connected, so there's a lot more discontinuity there. Um, so probably the, a lot of the benefits that we see in wetland restoration are probably gonna come from the epibenthic and epiphytic critters, which we know are much more common in the wetlands rather than uh, from the zooplankton themselves. And we'll also probably see export of vascular plant detritus to the zooplankton community in some cases. Then our, our last question was, how do zooplankton communities change along the salt to fresh ecocline? Um, we found definitely more cladocera and copepods in the freshwater, or barnacle nauplii in brackish water. Um, nothing super surprising there. We didn't really make any conclusions about abundance changes across the ecocline. I think some of that was the unbalanced design. We had uh, diked wetlands with huge abundances that were kind of unevenly distributed across our sampling um, frame. So that might have made it a little harder. Uh, some other analyses we have planned will um, just look at the channel sites and see how um, zooplankton change across the ecocline. And that'll be a little better way to test that hypothesis. And with that, I will take any questions. All right, thanks so much, Rosie. Uh, one of the questions in the chat we have is from Christina. She asks, uh, what do you think is driving this high amount of cladocerans in the cash slew diked wetlands? Um, it could be just limited predation of them not, uh, limited predation because of fish not being able to access that area. 
Yeah, limited um, fish predation is definitely a big thing. And um, they just can, they also don't have uh, water moving them around. So they can just kind of sit and cook, uh, eating up any of the phytoplankton. And often they're very high in phytoplankton as well. So um, you have a nice fresh water area, no fish or very limited fish. You can get really high densities pretty fast. Okay, makes sense. Okay, I had in a similar vein, I had a question about those diked wetlands. Um, typically, because they are occasionally uh, connected to the rest of the, the system and sloughs, if I'm, mm -hmm. if I believe right. So at what point do they get drained and does that coincide with the high production of Cladocera? And can that just be this huge input into the nearby sloughs? It definitely can be, um, but it really depends. So the way most of these fish, uh, sorry, duck clubs at least work is um, they're completely dried out in the summer. So, and the summer is often when we have highest production of the channels, of course. Uh, they're completely dried out in the summer. They manage the vegetation, that kind of thing. Um, they're flooded up in the winter, and then water is circulated uh, to a limited degree in and out of the from the wetland into the slough, um, but you know, not on the tidal cycle and not uh, a complete circulation. Usually, there's just just a little bit of flow. Um, but different clubs are uh, done differently, um, and then they're drained completely in the spring. So um, that can we obviously sampled in the spring right before they would have been drained. Uh, so in that case, they probably did get a big slug of cladosterins going out into the slough. But in other cases, you know, we can have a sort of boom and bust. And if the zooplankton eat up all of the phytoplankton or you get a low oxygen event in the um, diked wetland, you can end up with just a slug of low dissolved oxygen, mucky, nasty water getting into the slough. So it's um, really dependent. Uh, one of the ideas in the Delta Smelt Resiliency Strategy and some other um, potential management actions involve seeing if we can coordinate the duck clubs in Sassoon Marsh to key in when they should flood up and drain so that we can get a better slug of production into the sloughs when they drain. Um, but that's still kind of experimental, um, just in the, the scoping phases. Yeah, that'd be a really interesting idea. OK, uh, I have one more question from the chat. It comes from Marion Parker. She asks, uh, asks the, the Petaluma River was recently dredged for the first time in 17 years. What, plan what planktonic changes would you expect to see? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, short answer, I do not know. Uh, depends on, you know, I don't know the Petaluma River that well, but. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a lot of surveys out there, so. Very yeah, few. definitely not for zooplankton. And um, just thinking about some of the stuff we've talked about with vertical migration, some of um, WIM students' works have shown that they will, um, the zooplankton will hide down in the sediment during the day. So they'll actually go into the mud. So dredging could uh, disturb the copepod community. Uh, there are also a lot of benthic invertebrates that have pelagic life stages um, or you know, seasonally enter the plankton. So those are probably gonna get thrown off by that dredging. Also, I don't know how deep you were going uh, with this dredging and how shallow it was before. So that's going to probably affect what kind of changes you'd see. <laughs> As Jim points out, it's a good thing UC Davis sampled the Petaluma for zooplankton for three years with a CB net. So maybe we can answer some of that. <laughs> All right, show me the data. <laughs> OK, um, I don't see any. Oh, I do see one hand that just popped up. Uh, Tim, if you want to go ahead and answer your ask your question. Hi, Rosie. We've been hearing a lot about vertical migration um, in your sampling. Do you think that could account for some of the large amount of variation that you couldn't explain is simply differences in time of day when you were able to go out and sample? Possibly. I mean, usually we were out sampling between, you know, probably 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. So full daylight. 
So I wouldn't expect it to explain a ton of the variation. Um, but the other thing that we've looked at a little bit and still I'd love to look at more is, you know, vertical migration is probably a real big deal if you have a lot of space to vertically migrate. A lot of the channels that we were sampling, you know, are only a meter or two deep in there. So there's just not a lot of room for bugs to go up and down. Um, and I wonder if there are differences in the rates of vertical migration when you're in really shallow water like that. Okay, thanks so much, Rosie. That was a great talk. Thanks everyone for your questions. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our last talk for the symposium. Our next speaker is Hans Dom. They are a professor from the University of Connecticut. And so I'll go ahead and pass it off to Hans. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me just load up my presentation here. Okay, give me a second. All right, well, thank you very much to Sam and to um, the symposium organizers for this uh, um, invitation. Yes. Hey, Han. Yeah. Can I just interrupt for a second? We're seeing your presenter view. Can you just click on display settings at the very top, um, the oh. button up top that says display settings and yeah. then go to swap? No, it's not letting me do that. Hang on. Uh, huh. do you... That's interesting. Why is it doing that? Uh... Do you have two screens or do you only have one? Uh, hang on. Let me just get out of here for a sec. I have two screens, so that's probably the problem. Let's try again. Let's try this one. You see that? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. good. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, that could have gone better. Uh, are you? Are my? Am I back to presenter view? You are in the correct view now. We see only okay. your slides. Okay. Okay. Great. So again, thanks for the invitation, and I hope that this might prove a bit useful to your program. Um. Before I get going, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people and the agencies that make this possible. Uh, three agencies that have funded my work for the last 10 years or so. Of course, the heroes of the story are the members of my lab. Uh, and in particular for this talk, I'll be highlighting work from my former teach student, Matt Sasaki, and he's a postdoc in my lab now. And Okay, there's some weird noise. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and for uh, Jimmy DeMaio, who is a PhD student in my lab, and then my collaborators on the last uh, aspect of the talk I'll, I'll be giving. Um, Hans, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but we're still just seeing the first slide <sighs> of your title page. I'm sorry. Do you do you want one of us to share the slides and you uh, can, can you do that? Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't understand what the issue is. That's OK. Um, yeah, I can. See. Um, All right, I'm going to share this then. So I'll have to let you know when to advance the slide? Yeah. Does that look right. good to you? Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So we've gone through this. And uh, the, the next slide, I uh, already acknowledged the people who are working with me. Go ahead. All right. And then let's move on to the third slide. <laughs> 
Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on a couple of aspects of uh, climate change, warming and acidification, which have uh, direct effects on, particularly today, I'll be talking about uh, life history traits and fitness. And, okay, there is some weird buzzing in the background, guys. If, if somebody could stop that. Life history and fitness, and those uh, in particular can affect all of these things like the phenology, the bonds, the abundance, the distribution and structure of soil plankton, which in turn can uh, end up in mismatches with their predators, which of course may have effect on ecosystem services and functions. So there is some, some need to try to understand how climate change is affecting soil plankton populations. Go ahead. So today I'll address two simple questions. One is uh, what are the observable responses to climate change? And the other is how do soil plankton cope with climate change? And I'll use three separate approaches. One is historical, is using you know data now to data before. Uh, the other is uh, doing a space for time <clears throat> substitutions uh, to address questions of how so plankton may react to uh, future climate. And the last is using experimental evolution to try to understand how so plankton may adapt uh, to future climate. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so now, you know, be aware that I, I'm just going to cover a few things that are related to the work in my lab. I mean, this is a very broad subject. So uh, this is essentially the gospel according to Hans, and uh, I'm sorry to be parochial about it, but we only have 20 minutes. So the first issue uh, that I want to talk about is the reduction in soil plankton size. Uh, this is for a study that we did in Long Island Sound a few years ago. Um, this top figure here shows the uh, mean annual temperature in the sound from the late 40s until about 2010. And in that period of time, the temperature has increased by nearly two degrees. So the question is, what effect does that warming have on soil plankton size? And if you remember Bergman's rule, it tells you that with increasing temperature, uh, animal body size should uh, should go down. And that is indeed what we see for Acacia tonsa. Uh, on the left side of the panel, you see um, the body size of Acacia in the summer, uh, summer to fall. And this is data collected by Gordon Raleigh when he uh, was working in Long Island Sound. And on the right side, uh, my right side, uh, you'll see the data from the the year 2010 and 2011, uh, which is collected by us. And there is a significant decrease in the copepod size at about one micrometers per year. And that is essentially a 5% reduction in soil plankton size. Now, this is important, of course, because that is going to affect predator prey interactions. It is also going to affect uh, things like the fecundity of the animals and typically is also linked to uh, fast development time. Uh, so, uh, as nice as this was, it, uh, we wanted to explore this a bit in more detail. So, uh, we have a more detailed data set for uh, Tamara Longicornis, and that would be the next slide. All right. So, uh, with Tamara, I was fortunate. I'm old enough that I can show data from my dissertation here uh, back in the 80s, in the mid 80s. Uh, we have a comparison of uh, the conditions back in the mid 80s to what it is uh, in the early uh, portion of this century. Uh, we have the temperature on the top and the chlorophyll on the bottom here. And then we have individual body sizes of Tamara plotted versus temperature on the right size. Now, if you look at the top uh, graph here, you will see that the, um, you will see, <laughs> Somebody sent us an impressive regression. Indeed, 
but it's real. Uh, <clears throat> you will see that the the that the winters and early spring are warmer now than they used to be, whereas we don't really see much of a difference in the chlorophyll uh, between the two periods. Uh, we do see quite a bit of difference in the body size of Tamara. Uh, first of all, we do uh, we do see smaller animals in the uh, early in the closer period now as, as compared to the 80s. And we also see much less of a change seasonally relative to uh, the 80s. Now the question becomes, is this, are these changes driven by warming or are they driven by resource availability? Uh, next slide. So now if you plot the change in temperature, which is shown here on the x-axis, on a monthly basis, if you compare all those months between the 80s and, and now, as well as the changes in body size of, uh, of Tamara, what you do see a significant, uh, albeit relatively weak, but significant decrease in the size of the animals as, uh, as it gets warmer, right? But you do not see the same kind of pattern with um, uh, resource availability. So the inference here is that it is indeed uh, temperature, the warming that is driving the decrease in body size. And somebody's asking a question about uh, whether that could also be related to predation. And uh, uh, that's, that's, of course, that's a possibility, but we don't have data to test that hypothesis. Okay, uh, next, next uh, slides. So before I move on to talking about the um, issue of uh, space for time studies, I want to introduce two basic concepts uh, for how soil plankton may cope with uh, climate change, or in this particular case, let's talk about warming. And those are plasticity and uh, genetic adaptation. And in this figure here, what you see is uh, the curves here represent uh, plastic responses of two different genotypes. Uh, the blue genotype here, uh, as we move the uh, temperature away from their optimal uh, uh, performance, you would see a decrease in uh, performance and uh, possibly a decrease in fitness if the trade is related to fitness. Whereas in the yellow one here, we would see an increase in performance and fitness and therefore, one would presume that this phenotype is selected for, this one is selected against, and then if you were to get the population mean, you would uh, see that uh, the performance curve for the population would have evolved, which is consistent with adaptation. Uh, next. Okay, if now we can use the same ideas of the performance curve uh, to, in latitudinal studies, which of course are related to temperature as well, uh, to look at the interplay of adaptation and uh, phenotypic plasticity. Now, theory would tell you that uh, generalists which have broader performance curve would be at an advantage relative to the specialists at high and low latitudes uh, because the latter have narrower curves and they're also um, they're also uh, closer to their optimal performance. So any movement away from that uh, optimal value typically results in a reduction in uh, fitness. Next. So we used, uh, uh, again, a Carcia Tonsa to test some of these ideas. We uh, sample populations along the eastern seaboard. I think we sample 10 or 11 populations all the way from southern uh, to Florida. Um, we brought those populations back to the lab. Uh, we grew them under identical conditions for two generations to remove maternal effects. And then we did common garden experiments under two developmental temperatures, either 18 degrees or 22 degrees. And uh, doing this allows us to look at plasticity, of course. And then we did 
for each one of those populations, we generated survivorship cores, uh, as illustrated in this diagram here. This is individual su survivorship. And each one of these curves represents one of those populations we sample along here. The color scheme is related to the temperature. This is the populations from up north here, the blue, and the it gets, it's farther down towards Florida. And then from each one of these, we define a measurement of thermal tolerance as the LD50 for each one of the curves. And then the delta LD50, which is the difference between the thermal tolerance between the treatment at 18 and 22 degrees uh, here, represented by the, the solid line and the dashed lines here, uh, is a measurement of plasticity. All right, so what you can see immediately that there are strong differences in thermal tolerance between in the north and the south, but in between there's quite a bit of overlap, it turns out. Next. Now, if you replot this data as reaction norms, where we have the developmental temperature, the two developmental temperatures, and the LD50, three things become apparent to me. The first is that there is genetic differentiation of thermal tolerance, which is represented by the difference in elevations in these curves here. The second is that there is plasticity increases thermal tolerance, and that just means that all of these slopes are positive. None of them went down. And the third is that there is difference in the strength of plasticity, which means that some of these slopes are much uh, more pronounced than, than others. All right. <clears throat> That's all important to understand vulnerability of populations to, to climate change. So now if you just plot the LD50 versus the mean monthly temperature for each one of those populations, a positive relationship emerges, which is consistent with the idea that, you know, populations in lower latitudes and warmer temperatures are much better at handling uh, high temperatures than one at lower ones. However, this is quite interesting. There is an apparent trade-off between thermal tolerance here and plasticity, all right? The slope of these lines here. So increased uh, tolerance comes at, at the expense of reduced plasticity. Now, this is important because in the absence of evolutionary adaptation, populations at warmer climates are, which can only uh, cope with climate change using uh, phenotypic plasticity are at a disadvantage because they have much, much less plasticity to, to begin with. All right, next. So for the last two minutes of the talk, I want to illustrate this approach of experimental evolution. And we use that to look at uh, the response of uh, Karshev Tonsa to the simultaneous effect of warming and acidification. And why is this important? If you look at the performance curve here, this is what you might see just under temperature uh, stress. But if you set, if you add a second stressor as such as increased CO2, you might see a decrease of the performance curve, right? Of the, the decrease of performance, as well as a narrowing of the curve itself. And then if those interactions between temperature and CO2 are not additive, you may actually see even more pronounced effect, uh, lower performance and even narrower curve. But then the question becomes, is there scope for uh, evolutionary adaptation? So can animals cope with it? Can they do better in the future? Next. To answer that question, then we did a uh, long experiment, many generations. We did a, a, a full factorial between two temperatures, again, 18 degrees and 22 degrees. And this represents uh, what we think is the optimal temperature for a Karshetonsa in Long Island Sound. And this represents what we might see in the dire future. Uh, these are actual uh, CO2 conditions. And this is what, again, would cons be considered a dire greenhouse uh, environment where we would have high 
CO high temperature and high CO2 combined would be uh, this treatment. Mind the colors, blue is the control, green is the acidification treatment, yellow or orange is the temperature increase, the warming, and red is simultaneous uh, warming and acidification. Next. So we did 25 generation experiment. I think this is a world record for cell plant and ecology so far. And then we measure a bunch of life history traits that are relevant to fitness. And also we measure allele frequencies at several of those generations. So um, let me show the results of the experiment. Go ahead. So this is the results for the egg production and hatching frequency for the four treatments. And there's a lot of detail here. I don't have time to go through all of this, but I'm gonna concentrate on the greenhouse treatment, the full greenhouse, which is increased temperature and CO2. And uh, the histograms here represent the egg production and the curves represent egg hatching success, hatching frequency. So what you can see is that there is a very dramatic decrease in performance, both in egg production and hatchet success in the F0. So the classical ecological effect of stressors and what you typically see people reporting in, in, uh, in papers. But soon, as early as three generations, we see a significant increase in egg production and particularly in hatching success. And that hatching success remains high as well as the egg production remains higher than the F0. Next. Now, if you look at survivorship, that's a different story altogether. Um, the survivorship is independent of treatment throughout the first 12 generations. Okay, by the way, these this curves here are slightly offset for clarity. All of all these are in the same generation, but they look like they're not, but it's just so that they don't overlap with each other and make the graph messy. For, for the first 12 generations here, there is high survivorship in all of the treatments from N1 to adulthood. Uh, but for the greenhouse treatment, we see a decrease in survivorship after the 12th generation. And that's actually the only real significant decrease here uh, is, is, well, this, this, we see this asterisk here, here, and here. In the warm minute, it recovers, but it remains low here. So it doesn't look like survivorship is the trade under selection. Uh, so it's, that's not the mechanism for adaptation. Next. Okay, now, so if you remember, we measure all a bunch of things. I only show a few traits, but we, we measure development time, sex ratio, uh, size, all of these things. We can combine all of them and then put it into a Leslie matrix model to calculate population fitness, which is really what the currency you should use for adaptation arguments. And that's illustrated here by this parameter lambda. A lambda of one means that the population is at steady state. A lambda greater than one, the population is growing, positive uh, growth rate. A lambda less than one means negative growth rate. <clears throat> and again, you can see this very drastic effect of warming and acidification on the F0. And you see the synergistic effects between warming and acidification, right? Much worse effect in the combined and individual. It's more than additive, it's synergistic. But a rapid increase, so rapid uh, evolutionary rescue for this population uh, until generation 12, and then again, a, 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 a somewhat of, of a decrease uh, after generation 12. Now, this part of the curve is explained by the increased performance in egg production and hatching success, and this part of the curve is explained by the decrease survivorship after generation 12. But also notice here that we have now an antagonistic effect between warming and acidification, right? It's completely different from what was going on here. So two points that come out of this exercise. It's the first is that we do have rapid but limited adaptation under greenhouse conditions. 
illustrated here is limited because it didn't come back, it didn't remain full. The, the, the evolutionary rescue wasn't full. The other important thing is that the nature of the interactions between warming and acidification is different at the beginning of the experiment than at the end, which then it means that uh, this makes it challenging uh, to make predictions about the future performance of populations because the interactions don't seem to always work in the same way. Next. Okay, so the final uh, piece of the story here is uh, the genetic data, which is uh, been done with our collaborators from University of Vermont. Reed Brennan is a postdoc with uh, Melissa Paspeni, and we just have a paper recently submitted. And then during the F20 in this experiment, in this, uh, in this figure represent the F20, but we have data for other generations. Uh, it represents the allele frequencies, the genome-wide allele frequencies, and you can see that they're quite different between the control group represented in blue here and the greenhouse treatment represented here. And those allele frequencies represent divergence of a lot of functional genes that are shown here. I don't have time to, to discuss them all. But the point is that the phenotypic changes you were seeing are consistent with genetic changes in the population, and hence I'm making the argument that indeed what we see is evolutionary adaptation, it's not something else. Okay. Uh, so, in conclusion, next, uh, in, with regard to climate change, we do see the monstrous effects on soil plankton traits and population fitness, right? Traits like uh, body size and survivorship and then population fitness as illustrated by the evolutionary uh, um, the experimental evolution uh, study there is indeed considerable scope for adaptation to warming and acidification at least in acacia tonsa but it comes at a cost uh, because there isn't full uh, evolutionary rescue. Uh, my uh, PhD, uh, Jimmy DeMaio, is doing a beautiful thesis uh, measuring those costs. And the last point I want to make is that it's useful to integrate these approaches, these historical approaches and the uh, space for, uh, for time substitution and the experimental evolution to look at the responses uh, of SOPA to the climate change their constraints, such as the trade-off between adaptation and plasticity, and the mechanisms for copying as illustrated by the evolutionary uh, experimental evolution study. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to entertain questions for you now. Thanks, Thanks so much, so much Hans. Hans. Um, I think there's I a think few questions, questions in the, the chat. chat. I think we're, we're on time. Let me, so let me, let me, yeah, uh, okay. Let me just see, Hans, uh, Michelle, uh, aren't there cryptic species? Yes, yes, Michelle, that's a, that's an issue. Um, I do have, I, I saved one slide and I can save it, I can, I can send you the paper that, that Matt and I wrote on this. Um, there's a possibility of cryptic species. We do it measure genetic uh, markers for all of those populations. Um, I don't think they'd raise to the level of cryptic species, but even if there were cryptic species along that latitudinal gradient, it would not change, uh, well, it would change the conclusions about adaptation within the species, of course, but it wouldn't change the implications for vulnerability of those cryptic species along the way. But that is a good point, uh, and that's something that deserves more study. Uh, okay, but, yeah. I'm real quick. I'm hoping to butt in. Do you think you could answer these in the chat? I'd like to pass it off to Sam so we can wrap up the symposium. Okay, all right. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah. Um, thanks again to all our speakers for this section. And again, I'm going to pass it off to Sam and he will wrap up the symposium for us. Yeah, thanks, Arthur. And thanks everyone who talked today and yesterday. I think this was a really amazing symposium um, with a lot of really fantastic talks um, that came together really well. Uh, let me see. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone.
who's um, helped bring this together. Um, I want to note again that, you know, if we want to continue a group conversation afterwards, it would be great um, if people wanted to join this Zoopfest Google group just by following the link on the screen right now. Um, I really want to thank our planning committee members, um, which were Cheryl Patel, Arthur Barros, Rosemary Hartman, Christina Birdie, April Hennessy, Christy Bowles, and Trishel Temple, um, represented by the agency um, agencies below. Um, I also really want to thank the support we've gotten from the Delta Stewardship Council Meeting Services team, led by Brandon Chapin, who's really been super helpful in making everything work behind the scenes, um, along with his staff, Lita and Eric, um, and our wonderful communications staff, Brittany and Geneva. And lastly, of course, I want to thank all of the speakers who um, gave presentations during the symposium. I, I was super impressed with everything that we learned today, and I hope this will help move zooplankton research and understanding and management forward in this system and maybe others as well. Um, yeah, so thanks, everyone. Feel free to keep answering questions in the chat if you can um, and join the Google group if you want to continue it online, offline. That's all I had.